Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order. Welcome to everybody who's in the chambers here and watching online as well. Start a meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, good evening and welcome. We have, uh, we'll get to the agenda here in just a second. We've got a couple of things that of note that I do want to bring forward. But before we do that, we do have a roll call. Mr. Brillhart, if you could please call us, uh, call the roll of the council. Councilmember Beloga? Present. Councilmember Carter? Present. Councilmember Coulter? Present. Councilman, Councilmember Lohman? Here. Councilmember Martin? Present. Councilmember Nelson? Councilmember Nelson, perhaps you were muted. Not hearing you, Councilmember. He is indeed present, so why don't we okay. move on? <laughs> and Mayor and Mayor Bussey. Present. So let the record show all seven members of the Bloomington City Council are uh, either in the chambers or available remotely for tonight's council meeting. Move on to item four on our excuse me, item three on our agenda, which is the approval of the agenda. A couple of items that I do just want to call out. We do have a couple of timed items tonight. Item uh, five point, excuse me, six point, I'm losing it here now. 7.1 and 7.2 are timed items to uh, time to go at 6.30 and 6.40. So even though they're a, a bit further back in the agenda, we will be doing item 7.1 and 7.2 immediately after the public comment period at around 6.30 and 6.40. And then want to point out that item 8.3 in our organizational business is a closed session. And we will be going into closed session to discuss the municipal stormwater pond coordination litigation. Uh, there are limited examples and uh, reasons why cities can go into closed session. One of them is to discuss pending litigation and we will be going into closed session. So we will uh, finish up our work tonight. We'll go into a closed session. We'll have to clear the council chambers. We'll do the, uh, the item that we have. We will then go back into open session to adjourn the meeting. So just to let everybody know that uh, after, after we get done with item 8.2, we will be going into closed session. So council, are there any, those are clarifications, no changes to the, count, uh, to the, ch the agenda. Are there any additional changes or additions to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I would move approval of tonight's agenda. Second. Got a motion and a second by council member Beloga for the approval of tonight's agenda. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillhart. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? And no audio on Councilmember Nelson. Let the record show that he mouthed the word aye. And Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. We do have an agenda for tonight's meeting. Councilmember uh, Nelson, perhaps uh, a log out and a log back in to see if we can't get your audio working or somehow we got to troubleshoot this because I'm sure we'd like to hear from you tonight. So if we could do that. With that, we will move on to item four on our agenda, which is the public comment period. It's a 20 minute period at each council meeting where we, where uh, folks are uh, allowed to come before the council and bring forward items not on tonight's agenda. And we have two up pieces of the public comment period. Item 4.1 is a response to the prior meeting's public comments. 4.2 is the public comment period itself. We will start with item 4.1, the response to the prior meeting's public comments. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. At our previous council meeting, we had a number of uh, residents that spoke to the council either in person or uh, virtually. Only uh, one specifically asked a question for follow-up. That was uh, Ms. Uh, Becky Strohmeyer asked uh, why the city has hired a porn actor to do ch uh, children's shows in Bloomington. So I think this requires a little bit of context. Uh, we became aware last year that one of the performers that had been hired to uh, be at the upcoming Pride Festival uh, had a social media uh, platform that had explicit material on it. Uh, we investigated once we were aware of that, uh, made a determination that that was not the uh, image that we wanted to present for our first Pride uh, uh, 
uh, event here in Bloomington, and uh, that, that performer will not be uh, present at Pride this coming weekend. So I also want to follow up just by reiterating some of what I said uh, last week. Uh, one is uh, Pride uh, will still proceed on Saturday, August 14th from 5 until 9 p.m. at Civic Plaza. It is a family-focused, uh, community-oriented event that will be uh, a celebration of LGBTQI plus people in our community and their families and their friends and their allies. And I want to make sure that everybody knows that we are still proceeding with the program and uh, there isn't a change to the program uh, as a result of uh, some of the uh, social media uh, outrage or whatever you would care to describe it. I would care to describe it as unfortunate and to some extent ugly uh, that some of the commentary uh, has tried to make a correlation between uh, sexuality and um, pedophilia which, to be clear, there is no correlation between sexuality and pedophilia. And the fact that people are doing that, I think, is just continuing um, what I would say uh, tiptoes right up to the edge of hate speech and is, I think, an unfortunate um, element of the fact that we're trying to do an event here to celebrate members of our community. So uh, the event will be going forward. Uh, we will have a successful family-focused event, and we're looking forward to seeing people here celebrating Pride on August 14th. Council, any questions? Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just to clarify, you had said we had found out about that last year. Did you mean to say last week? I apologize if I misspoke. I did say uh, it was uh, only a couple hours before the council meeting last week is when I became aware of it, yes. Thank you for that clarification. Council, anything else? No additional questions. The other uh, item that did, was brought forward last week was in regard to Anita Smithson, a uh, human rights commissioner here in the city of Bloomington, and a couple of uh, requests that uh, she be removed from the Human Rights Commission for comments that she made and on social media. And um, in looking at that, the, uh, our official rules for our commissioners and our, um, and our volunteers, basically our city volunteers, they don't fall under the staff protocol in terms of uh, the, the social media policy. So there isn't a, so a specific social media policy for our commissioners or for volunteers. Uh, our council rules also state that while a, uh, a commissioner uh, serves basically at the will of the council and may be removed for any reason, there isn't a specific list of reasons outlined as to why a person may be removed. And so to this point, uh, I have not heard from any council members who wish to go down that path, who wish to discuss this. And uh, so despite what we've heard, what we heard, uh, I have not heard any from any member of the council that uh, we want to take this up. So just wanted to clarify that, that uh, that's where it stands. I've had a chance to speak with uh, Ms. Smithson, and uh, she is, uh, she understands that her comments were, were hurtful to uh, the Bloomington police officers and police department, and, and especially their families who participated in the Back the Blue event. And I know she's apologized for that, sent an apology through to... Thank you. Thank you. Please don't interrupt. You're lying. You're lying. There's no apology. Please don't interrupt. Tell the truth. If you want to disrupt the meeting, you'll be asked to leave. She apologized to the Bloomington Police Department, and uh, both uh, through a statement through the Star Tribune, and I know through a statement that she sent to Chief Hartley, that Chief Hartley forwarded on to the rest of the department. And uh, uh, in, in, uh, she and I spoke, as I said, and uh, after speaking, uh, from my perspective, I consider the matter dead, a past matter. Uh, we're, we're moving past it and moving on. So that's where, that's where I stand. And council, again, if there are any members of the council who wish to bring forward a, a discussion to possibly remove Ms. Smithson, that's, that's open for uh, discussion and suggestion. We could do that at our council issues and updates the end of the meeting, but uh, without that, I can, as I said, I consider this to be a past issue and we're moving on. Questions on that? Council Member Lohman? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I know that last week we had brought forward I had an issue and in, in, uh, updates around talking about commissioner type stuff. Um, and I, I do think that it would make some sense to, given the circumstances, and we've had other circumstances in the past, uh, just to bring more clarity around uh, uh, those folks who do serve in that volunteer uh, capacity, uh, not only their, their actions, but also um, 
what uh, staff and also what council's expectations are uh, for those particular roles. Um, not specific to this particular situation, but just in general. Um, I think we gotta take that up if it's early next year or, or sooner. Um, but thank you, Mayor. Thank you, council member. Council members, anything else on this? Seeing no one, we will move on to our public comment period. As I said, a 20 minute period that we hold at each council meeting where folks can come forward and address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. Uh, each speaker is limited to uh, five minutes. We do have a clock to make sure that folks stay within their five minutes just so it's fair for everyone. Questions from the council will be for clarification only. It's not a back and forth. It's not a time for problem solving or dialogue. It's an opportunity to listen to what uh, community residents or community members might have as concerns or questions and then we respond to them at the next meeting as part of item 4.1, the response to the prior meeting's comments. So we had a, a number of folks call in and wish to speak tonight, and I'm just going down the list that uh, Mr. Brillhart was able to provide to me with uh, the folks who wanted to speak. So Mr. Uh, Josh Edberg, Mr. Edberg, are you with us this evening? Um, Mayor Bussey, that was going to be a, um, Mr. Edberg was a call in. Oh, thank you. Uh, Amy, is Mr. Edberg available on? the phone. Nora, do we have a Josh Edberg on the phone? Yes, ma'am. Uh, kindly press star one for you to speak. Press star one uh, for you to speak. Mr. Joshua Edberg, can you please press star one? Mr. Joshua Iberg, your line is open. Hello, City Council. Good evening, Mr. Edberg. Um, Welcome. My name is... Oh, hi. Um, yeah, I wanted to provide comments on last week's meeting, which I did view, and I want to thank the Council for their kind words. That really was reassuring to me as a Bloomington resident. I am a, a counselor who does counsel um, sex offenders and I work with police to make sure the community is safe and healthy sexualities are met. And let me tell you, um, my friend was bullied and I could not believe that. And again, thank you for the kind words. Um, it means so much, but I work with the lowest of the low. And let me tell you, my friend is not that. He respects children. And honestly, all the information presented last week was false by Becky. Um, yeah, he does not do that. He is a respected member of the Twin Cities LGBTQ community. And it was a great disrespect to hear that because you are not protecting the community, Becky, with your words. You are fueling division, and I call you, you call yourself a patriot? Mr. Edberg? You are Mr. not. Mr. Edberg? Yep. If you could please direct your comments mm -hmm. to the council. This is an opportunity to, to address the council. If you could please direct okay. your comments to the council. All right, but I am just so glad that the city council is going forward with pride, and he is not that. There are much bigger things to worry about in our community right now than a drag performer who identifies as, you know, Satanist, pagan, but he has a healthy, consenting relationship. And it was just a shame to see that displayed yesterday. And I am so glad that we are having pride. So keep on doing it. And thank you so much. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Edberg. Next up on our list is uh, Paul Coat. Do I need to sign in first here? If you could, please. No name on that, sir. As a reminder, if you wish to speak for public comment, you may press star one on your telephone keypad. Pound one. <laughs> Good evening. 
Good evening, I'm Paul Cote, father of two, Bloomington resident, District 1. In recent weeks, and again tonight, we've heard some complaints or about complaints about upcoming Pride event on August 14th, and Bloomington Human Rights Commissioner Anita Smithson's comment that a recent Back the Blue rally promoted, quote, radical uh, or fascist radicalization. I'll speak on both matters under the umbrella of giving people the benefit of the doubt and judging good faith. I'll start with a personal story and then declare my beliefs. When my son was four at a national night out event, he was invited by a police officer to bet his, uh, pet his police dog. The dog bit him on the face, leaving a lifelong scar. After the incident, people told me to sue the Bloomington Police Department and publicize my anger on social media, but I said no. It was an accident. Our family connected with that officer. I gave the benefit of the doubt to that officer, and I trusted that he was acting in good faith. So now freely judge my good faith when I tell you that I absolutely believe that black lives matter and that systemic racism in America leads many in law enforcement to treat people of color differently than white citizens, and we have to fix that. Now, there are those who say that such words are an attack on police. A call for reform is dismissed as an attack on a uniform. When I say black lives matter, or when a person of color speaks of their experience with police, we're not judged as acting in good faith. These critics shout blue lives matter in response to black lives matter as they wave a, a black and white American flag with a thin blue line across the middle. But that flag, that imagery, was recently banned by a UW-Madison police chief because this seeming symbol of solidarity with police has been co-opted across the country uh, by some by what she calls, quote, extremists with hateful ideologies, including terrorists who waved that same flag at the US Capitol on January 6th as they attacked police. Should we give those who wave that flag the benefit of the doubt after America witnessed waivers of that flag ironically attacking cops? I don't know. Fascism is defined as far-right authoritarian ultranationalism that supports the forcible suppression of opposition. Our families saw that on January 6th when we saw that, uh, that flag waved by cop bashers. Perhaps that's why Anita Smithson made such a connection. One of the Bloomington Back the Blue rally organizers helped organize another rally on January 6th at our state capitol and even called that rally Storm the Capitol. Law enforcement had to put our governor's family under protection because of violent threats spewed by speakers there. That same organizer has recently taken to social media to rile up their audience about another matter, drag queens at Bloomington's Pride event on August 14th that they accuse of wanting to harm children. Bloomington Pride was given so little benefit of doubt that the event would be family friendly that these critics investigating the internet footprints of the drag performers to weaponize any dirt they might find are now demonizing everyone associated with the event because they found explicit adult internet content associated with a drag queen. Well, I looked at the internet footprint of that organizer of that Back the Blue rally and found photos of that organizer with January 6th insurrectionists and the following Facebook post, which I am emailing you all screenshots of. December 6th at 5.15 a.m. about the St. Paul Police Department. Quote, God help them because they just made a fatal error. Who do you serve, SPPD? Effing terrorists, that's who, end quote. That profane, violent threat doesn't sound like backing the blue, and it doesn't sound family friendly. If the supporters of the Back the Blue rally want Anita Smithson and all of us to give them the benefit of the doubt and to believe that they're acting in good faith, despite profane, explicitly anti-cop internet content by one of their leaders, then the benefit of the doubt and a judgment of good faith can likewise be given to those who I express support for here. Bloomington pride, the beautiful people it celebrates, and yes, those fabulous drag queens. Mayor and Council, I believe in your good faith to keep protecting children from all forms of violence. Keep protecting Bloomington families from all forms of hatred. And please take with a serious grain of salt those who are so quick to bully and attack LGBTQ people, people of color, our Human Rights Commission, and our public servants. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colt. Next on our list, uh, Becky Strohmeyer. Mr. Meyer. Wow, it's almost like this meeting is about me today. This is super interesting. <clears throat> well, 
I had a whole nice five-page speech prepared here, but it seems like I have to address some things that I've heard in the past 20 minutes here. First of all, to Mr. Colt that just said that, uh, I would like to add some context to my statements about the St. Paul police. Um, that was immediately after uh, our protest outside the mansion had been attacked by BLM and Antifa. Uh, we had tires slashed on cars. We had anarchist symbols carved into our vehicles, all while 100 police officers held us all back and let them proceed to destroy our cars, assault our journalists. Um, somebody got arrested for trying to pull that woman out of being assaulted. So yeah, I was a little disappointed in police that day. Jamie, kind of wondering, um, so if me exposing a Satanist pornographer who not only films pornography, but films pornography role-playing with young boys at family events. See, that's the big part you're leaving out here, okay? Nobody's upset about your everyday drag queen. It is a little ridiculous that taxpayers are paying for drag queens. I don't know. You know, the city of Bloomington has been spending thousands of dollars every year to host a booth at Pride, and I've never said anything about it. So you can stop the conspiracy theory about it's just we hate gay people. That's not it. No, I hate Satanist pornographers who have a fetish for incest and young boys dressing up like a woman to entertain children. And it's really pathetic that this has to be explained so much and so hard to you people. What, what don't you get about what's wrong with that? It's not hate speech. How is it hate speech for me to call out a Satanist pornographer that you guys hired to entertain our children, but it's not hate speech for the Human Rights Commissioner to call, us fa call our event fascist radicalization and call us fascists and continue to double down on her actual hate speech towards me. Okay, so what is, how come we can't call out what is something obviously wrong? Obviously there's something wrong with it if you canceled it. It took you four days. You were alerted to it and it took you, would have taken you 20 minutes to verify that information on Twitter. Took me 20 minutes, wasn't that hard. Okay, but it took you four days. And that's because you guys don't listen to us. I can come up here and be like, oh my goodness, you guys hired a pornographer and the porn is actually on Twitter for everyone to look at. And you guys will just tune me out. Just like you tune out all the residents that come to you with the truth. So it took you four days after legal threats, after phone calls, after a whole lot of other people had to get involved, then you decided to do the right thing and give me the win. I know it's giving me a win to cancel the satanic pedophile pornographer. Man. You know, I don't have time to do this now. Um, it's just real interesting how you guys hate me so much that now this has become about me and giving in to me instead of doing what's right for the people of Bloomington. You know you've gotten enough complaints about this, but you guys don't want to break up your little thing you've got going. Do the right thing. This isn't a win for me. I don't want taxpayers paying for drag queens whatsoever. Okay, that's not cool. That's not something a lot of taxpayers, I've met Democrats that don't even like that. Okay, do the right thing. Stop you know, giving your friends the benefit of the doubt and letting your friend, you know, Jenna, Anita Smith sends a big campaign donor to your campaign. Wonder why you're giving her a pass. She's your friend, of course. Nathan, she's your friend. Bussy, she's your friend. You guys are here to serve the residents of this community, not your friendships. Okay, if you're such great friends, your friendship will survive her terrible mistakes. Start serving the residents of Bloomington. Thank you, Ms. Stromeyer. Mike Picard, Mr. Picard, are you here this evening? Good evening, Mr. Picard. Hello. Uh, Mayor, council members, um, as suggested by the city manager, I contacted Amy Larson, who is the city of Bloomington's risk litigation manager. Uh, she contacted the city's insurer, LMC 
IT, and they have agreed to reopen my claim. Uh, she did confirm my assertion that Duan does not have a written policy in place to cover damages caused by golfers. Um, reopening the claim is a nice gesture, but I think it is a futile endeavor. Uh, here is why. Say I purchase homeowner's insurance from State Farm, but I do not purchase insurance on my vehicle. I get into an accident and my vehicle suffers damage. No matter how many times I submit a claim for the damages, State Farm will always deny the claim. Okay? They do not insure my vehicle, they insure my home. Currently, no matter how many times my damage claim is looked at, it will never be paid because Duan does not have a policy covering damage caused by their paying customers. Talk to Amy Larson, uh, she's on the staff, she will verify there is no policy. Uh, here's what I think should be done. Number one, pay for my windshield. Number two, have management start a written log of any calls the club receives related to damage to property. Last week the city manager said there have only been two claims filed with the city insurer. I know that one of my neighbors called a few years ago about damage. He too was told the, the same assumed risk spiel that I heard and he filed a claim with his insurance. No log, no record, faulty data. Okay, it's not, they're not logged. Uh, drop a written damage policy that covers not only the ideal case where a neighbor sees the golf for causing a damage, but also the case like mine. The policy needs to include a requirement that management needs to make an effort and show up. Stop by and look at the damage. Pretend you care, even if you don't. Have Duan look at purchasing an insurance policy that covers damage or injury from its paying customers. Right now, filing a claim is useless. This will bring in an unbiased third party. No one wants the city of Bloomington randomly paying for every broken windshield, but real damage is happening at times during the 14 hours Duan is open to property where the homeowner does not see the golfer. Making me and my neighbors responsible for 100% of the damage 24-7 strikes this former science teacher as the most illogical part of the current policy. Be aware of the areas where most of the errant shots occur. Remember when the lady who talked about housing talked about the importance of data? If Duan sent one employee out to walk the fence line at the same time each day, they could tally the number of errant shots in each area. Netting projects are expensive. Weigh the trade-off. A budget item for yearly damage versus a budget for netting which makes the most uh, financial sense. So I have two questions. Do we all agree that Duan does not carry liability insurance for damage or injury caused by their paying customers hitting air and shots out of the course? A second question, since a claim for damages will never be approved, will Duan continue to offer this option to the next person who contacts them about damage or injury? Or will they inform the person that filing a claim is futile and it will never be approved? And I've been lazy lately. Only went on one walk. <laughs> this is the past. This is the present. I think Duan is getting a better, higher skilled level set of golfers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Picard. Councilmember Loman. One question for uh, Mr. Picard, uh, if, I, if I could. Um, you raised uh, during your public comment, and I just wanted for clarification, are you looking for those three things that you brought forward for council to respond uh, to those th those three things? The, you mean the, the questions at the end about... Um, well, the questions, but you had mentioned there are three things that you wanted to get down, including the written log and... Uh, oh, and yeah, I would, I would like to see that happen. Um, well, I think it just makes sense. You have a business, you should log the people calling in. They don't, I, I'm sure they don't do that right now. And, um, you know, I, I know my memory's not, you know, I don't remember, you know, if people call. But I, I think that, I think that, yeah, I think Duan needs to look at what they're doing in terms, when, when there's damage. It should be in writing. They should log the calls, you know, then they should actually come out and look at the damage. And um, you know, just the whole policy needs to change. I think I think it needs to be more, you know, neighborly. I guess the word would be. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pickard. Uh David Edstrom. 
Mr. Edstrom, are you here or is uh, Mr. Edstrom on the phone calling in tonight? Amy, could you check to see if Mr. Edstrom is on the phone? Nora? Uh, there are no participants over the phone, sir, at the moment. Oh, there are no participants over the phone at the moment, sir. Thank All right, very good. All right, we have just a couple minutes left in tonight's public comment period. Is there anyone else here in the chambers who'd like to address the comment, uh, council on items not on tonight's agenda? Dr. Simon. Yes, you do. Okay, so I'm Christine Wheely, and I'm just um, here on behalf of the Bloomington residents and um, would just like to address the uh, event coming up this weekend, and I would ask that you would reconsider hosting that event with the, the Pride event. Um, first and foremost, I just want to read uh, why it's important, um, according to the um, Article 1, Section 16 of the Minnesota Constitution Bill of Rights that talks about the freedom of conscience, no preference given to any establishment of worship or religion. And we know that um, the this is a secular humanism um, gathering. And so I'm just going to read that. Secular humanism means a faith-based worldview that is also referred to a postmodern uh, Western individualistic moral relativism or expressive individualism and anti-theism and is often the mirror opposite of theism. The term refers to a religion whose doctrine worships man as the source of all knowledge and truth, a belief system that is centered on the unproven assumption that there is no moral absolutes and that there is no moral doctrine should be used as a superior basis for law and policy. There's more that goes into this, but basically drag queen story time, all of these things are, um, it says here that it's a non-secular event uh, where men dress up as women and display inherently sexualized performance that targets minors with the purpose of promoting and normalizing the faith-based beliefs and practices that stem from the LGBTQ secular humanistic religion. And so there's a lot that goes into this. Um, this, this is indecent, and it's against the moral standards of the community to provide and to host um, what we know is the drag queen story time or even the event coming up here with those, the Satanist, pornographic, we can go online and see what they're going to be presenting. And I would really ask on behalf of the children, the families, that you take out your emotional appeals, like the friendships, like what Becky was saying, will stand. But this is, this is unacceptable in this city and it's you know we see that in Minneapolis all the time but this is this is different so um the emotional appeal is a method of persuasion through sentiment not logic that is designed to create an emotional response we know that men or women dressed up with half of their clothes on creates an emotional response especially to those children who are very young and who may not even understand, but it's putting things in their mind that is indecent, and this you're gonna this is not acceptable here. Um, and taxpayer dollars should not be paying for this. So taxpayer standing means the standing of a taxpayer to file a lawsuit, you know, basically against the government actor that is directly or symbolically engaging in practices that violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of Article 1, Section 16 of the Minnesota Constitution Bill of Rights after it actually or prospectively engaged in an action poten potentially failed at least one prong of the lemon test. The term t indicates a test that requires a minimal logical nexus in order to be invoked by a taxpayer when the government is directly or symbolically endorsing a religion in a coercive manner in violation of the lemon test. A person who pays sales tax in the state can successfully assert this form of standing. So we ask that you cancel the event because it's it should not be going forth and we should not have to pay um, for such an act. And I just think about you know, it's like I've been downtown and I've seen these men and people dressed this way in, in these events. And I'm an adult. And to see their penis hanging out and wearing their 
undergarments or undressing, like the Rosedale Mall situation, undressing, that is unacceptable. So it's not a matter of, you know, them doing this or that. We're just asking that you would remove this from the open public air, the open air, the open public, and that that kind of exposure be kept in a strip club or somewhere that is these people are of age at least. And so that's all I have to say. And um, we appreciate you hearing us out today. So I'm just speaking on behalf of me and uh, the, the Patriots, the Bloomington Patriots, uh, many different, many different groups. And, um, you know, again, we're wanting to reiterate that it's not necessarily that we're saying, you know, whether we agree or disagree on what people want to do and how they want to present themselves. I just want you to Ms. know Wheely. it's beyond. Ms. Wheely, you know. your time is up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to address the council tonight? Seeing no one coming forward, I will close tonight's public comment period and we will move on in our agenda. And as I mentioned earlier, we have two timed items. So we're going to move ahead to item 7.1, which is a timed item starting at 6.30. You missed by a couple of minutes, but I think we're okay. This is a resolution awarding the sale of general obligation charter bonds, series 2021A. Our CFO, Ms. Lori economy Scholler, is going to lead us through this. Good evening. Welcome. Good, good evening, Mayor and Council. So this evening, uh, I am here to uh, give good news to the council in regards to uh, the taxable, um, sorry, they're not taxable, they're tax exempt geo bonds. So just need to fix that piece of it. Earlier uh, this month, we uh, received our credit rating report from Standard & Poor's, they went through that and um, to let you know that they did reaffirm our AAA and um, others like Fitch and um, Moody's will come on when we uh, do our bond rating for our fall bond sale for our PMP. But we only had Standard & Poor's to keep the fees low on this particular one and they did affirm our AAA. Some of the comments from AAA from um, Standard & Poor's but the city is very strong in our economy. So when they look at Bloomington's economy, they not only look at the city's economy, they look at the metro, the mall, and all the pieces that uh, play with in the area of the economy. They also look at very strong management. We have long-term um, detailed financial plans, and we adhere to good um, policies. And they also look at just the management and look at um, the council and how cohesive the council is and senior staff. So there's not a lot of change and maneuvers there. So we've got good remarks there on the very strong. We also have a positive budget variance as we end 2020 and that was above our policy limit. And so they're very happy with that piece too. And our strong debt and contingent liability is well within the realms that they're looking at for that um, analysis. Just going into some of the project detail at Dred Scott, we're looking at a lighting project that's been underway. Uh, this is phase one of it. There'll be other phases. Um, you can see little dots there in the middle where the lights are going to go. There's also a fencing piece, safety nettings in um, fields five through seven, and tennis courts. And these tennis courts is a pretty much a total scrape and rebuild. So um, I think there was some conversation earlier today on the tennis courts. This is just a picture of how bad some of the tenant courts currently look like there. Some of the funding for the bonds will go to the Herbert dugouts. There is approximately um, $300,000 of funds coming in from different grants, the twins, the county, um, helping fund this dugout piece. And then there's about 300,000 from the bonds that will go to these dugouts. And that will be done this fall. And then there are electronic reader board signs and school playground projects, um, and both at Normandale Hills and at Washburn. That are, those are both underway. 
So initially the council approved a reimbursement resolution for 3950000 Looking at what was in our CIP and some of the projects, one of the projects that was in there was for um, parking lot improvements at a couple of the parks. That project did not get underway, so that will be looked at maybe next year. So that was included in the top number. And then what we went out into the market t today, this morning in, was $2,395,000. With the premium that um, was there for that, our final amount of the bonds is now $2,005,000. Um, it's a 10-year term. We had six bidders. Um, the initial interest cost, total interest cost, um, initially was at just over 1%, and we ended at 88%, or excuse me, 0.88%. Um, without the premium, it would have been a little bit lower, but the, the premium added a couple basis points. So it was initially at an um, 0.857, and with the premium, it's at 0.886. So again, this was for the CI pro CIP projects, and um, they commenced in the summer, and they will finish in early 2022, and property taxes will be paying for these bonds. So just giving you some current bonding information and timelines. So this evening, we are asking the council to award the bid to BARD through the information for the 2 million, 5, 2 million, yeah, 5,000 and um, we'll get the receipt of the bond proceeds and the closing will happen on September 9th. And then um, in September, later in the month, we'll ask council to set sail for the PMP bonds. And then um, either late October, early November, depending on where we look at the market to see if there's any ticks in the interest rates climbing, uh, to set sail for that day and sell the bonds. And then late 2021 to early 2022, we might be looking at bonds for the fire station. So the motion before the council is to accept the low bid at $2,005,000 for these bonds. Tell us any questions. I, I do have a question. I don't know, have, have we seen interest rates that low before? Mayor and Council, when we issued the bonds back in um, November of last year, it was at a 0.71. Wow. And that was the lowest that I could find in any of our bond documents for at least 20 years. But still, remarkably low. Remarkably wow. low interest rates this time. My goodness. When I look at that 0.88 and I look at our investment market, where we're getting our investment returns, and you see those reports every month, we're at a 0.8. So we're very close to what we're entering on our money to what we're selling. My goodness. Well, well done. I'm glad to hear that. Council, questions on this? Council Member Beloga or Nelson, uh, speak up. If I, I don't know if I can see you. So if you have a question, please speak up. All right. Hearing no one uh, coming forward on this, um, so our public hearing is on the next one, correct? This is just a this is just an acceptance of a, of a, the resolution. I'm, am I correct in that? Correct, Mayor. I just want to be sure. All right, Council. If there's no more questions, I would uh, look for comments or actions or how do we want to proceed with this? Councilmember hey, uh, Coulter. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, I'm happy to make the motion. I don't see anybody. Councilmember Coulter. Jumping. All right, Mayor, I will move to adopt a resolution awarding the sale of, it just disappeared. <laughs> some bonds for some things. <laughs> All right. <laughs> awarding the sale of General Obligation Charter Bonds Series 2021A in the principal amount of $2,005,000, fixing their form and specifications, directing their execution and delivery, and providing for their payment. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Martin to award the sale of the General Obligation Bond Series 2021A. Thank you. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillhard. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Well, thank you very much for that. As I said, uh, very impressive numbers there. Uh, very impressed that uh, how the, the bond houses continue to view Bloomington's 
financial state, especially after the tough year and a half that uh, the city of Bloomington and every city in the state of Minnesota has had. So that's it's very nice to hear. So it thank is. you for it's that. Very, very good news this morning. And with that, we'll move to item 7.2, which is also a timed item. And this is a public hearing. And it's a public hearing regarding the Friendship Village host approval. Ms. Economy Shoulder. So Mayor and Council, I don't have a PowerPoint for the presentation. This is generally a, a short item. The um, IRS rules require that if another location, another government location um, is issuing the debt and they're gonna spend that debt in our city for a project, whether it's refinancing or um, building, um, that host city has to give permission to spend those dollars in our city. So that's the item before the council this evening. So the Iowa Finance Authority has, is issuing, wants to issue up to $175 million of bonds, and they are doing that for life space communities. And so life space is Friendship Village, and they'll be using 45 million of that 175 in Bloomington. So we have David Grosskloss and David Miller from Life Space. Uh, David Grosskloss is from Dorsey Whitney. Should you have any questions from the host group? Council, questions on this? Do we understand what we're doing here? Uh, just basically, uh, Council Member Coulter? Thank you, Mayor. Just to sort of clarify for the, the public and, and folks watching at home here, this is not a financial obligation of this city. This is simply the city providing permission for the, these bond proceeds to be spent within the city of Bloomington. This is not city dollars, correct? Mayor and Council Member Coulter, that is very much a correct statement. The um, Iowa Finance Authority is the issuing and they're the obligation of that group and the actual payments will come through life space. These are revenue bonds. It is not an obligation of the city of Bloomington. That's what I intuited, but I just wanted to, to make sure. Thank you. Yes. Council, any additional questions? Hearing none, this is a public hearing. And right now, I would like to open the public hearing on item 7.2, which is regarding the Friendship Village host approval. Is there anyone present who would like to speak on item 7.2 at this public hearing? Anyone would like to speak? I see no one coming forward. Amy, can we see if there's anyone on the phone who would like to speak to item 7.2? Nora, do we have anyone? Again, as a reminder. Yes, ma'am. As a reminder, if you wish to speak for a public comment, you may press star one on your telephone keypad. Item 7.2. Again, please. Please press star one if you wish to speak. Thank you. As of the moment, ma'am, there are no um, who we should speak, there's none. You may proceed. Thank you. We have no one on the phone who would like to speak. Last call for anyone in the chambers who would like to speak on item 7.2. Seeing no one coming forward, Council, I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. so moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Beloga, second by Council Member Martin to close the public hearing on item 7.2. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillard. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Public hearing is closed on item 7.2. Council, I would look for action on this. Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to uh, uh, move the item. Council Member Beloga? Uh, move to approve the resolution granting whole city approval for the issuance of bonds by the Iowa Finance Authority. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Beloga, second by Council Member Martin, to uh, approve the resolution granting host of city approval to issuance of by the bonds by the Iowa Finance Authority. Hearing no further council discussion on this, Mr. Brillhard. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you much. Thank you much for that. Thank you, Council. With that, we will actually double back in our agenda to item five, to our introductory items. And item 5.1 on our agenda is the introduction of new employees. Mr. Babrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. 
this agenda item this evening, which we have just recently uh, restarted after a little bit of a hiatus, is to introduce both to the council and to the community uh, new employees coming to work for the city and to uh, serve the residents and businesses and visitors of Bloomington. Uh, so this evening we have, I believe, two new employees in community development. I'm going to invite uh, Community Development Director Carla Henderson up to introduce our new employees. Good evening, Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, so I have two employees that I'd like to introduce virtually. The first employee is June Wei Tan, who is an environmental health specialist in environmental health. And he is approaching his six month anniversary. And there he is. <laughs> and then we also have Elizabeth Bushaw, who is a part-time office support specialist in buildings and inspections, and there's Liz right there, yes. And so um, I did wanna share that um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce them to this honorable body. I do wanna share a story about June Wei. Um, he came across a resident that an elder woman who needed her garage door painted and repaired. And uh, Brush With Kindness, it's a, a part of Habitat for Humanity. And so they reached out and the rep that was working with the homeowner said, can you give her some time because I'm gonna try to find some resources to help this resident. And so June said, well, great. I mean, can we use this for other residents? And um, so they said, well, you know, we like to work partner with uh, municipalities. And so June sent it up the chain, Lynn Moore reached out. A call was made with Barb Wolf and Erica Coleman with Brush With Kindness, and in the next 30 days, we will have a formal relationship and be able to provide this opportunity. Uh, they're able to leverage, because they use skilled staff and skilled volunteers. And so I want to acknowledge June Way for that, taking that initiative, because that's the kind of staff we have here in the city of Bloomington. I'm extremely proud of that. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, we, I, 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 welcome. First of all, welcome to both of you. I'm, I'm sorry you're not here with us this evening. It's much, you know, the introductions are much nicer face to face and in person. But uh, still, very glad to have you on staff. And uh, as new, as new as six months, or, or somewhere in between now and six months, that uh, your new employees here in the city of Bloomington. If um, it, could you just, uh, if you could, please tell us just a bit more about yourself, where you came from, um, your impressions so far of the city of Bloomington, and, and just a, a chance to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Junwei Tan, and like Carla mentioned, I work in community development. I'm in environmental health and under Lynn Moore. Um, so I actually came from Hennepin County. Um, so I started with them in October last year, and I only worked for them for five months before I came over to Bloomington. Um, a little bit about myself. I grew up in Singapore, born and raised, um, two years of mandatory military service um, in Singapore before coming over to Minnesota. I did my undergrad at the U, um, went out to Reno for grad school, and you know I love Minnesota so much, so I came back. So that's a little bit more about myself. Um, the city is a great place. Um, everyone's really friendly, um, and it's very welcoming, so I'm glad to be here. And we're very glad to have you. Thank you very much. Welcome to your way. Liz, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so like Carla said, uh, I am a part-time office support specialist with the building and inspections department. And I started the same day as June. So we're both about six months <laughs> in. Um, I actually have a background in planning. And I did that for a couple of years before I kind of realized it wasn't really a fit for me. Um, so I'm kind of back to the drawing board and I'm um, now looking into going back and getting a master's in public health. Um, my impressions of the city so far are I have a super high opinion of Bloomington in my experience at this point. Um, it's the leadership that I've witnessed has been um, outstanding. Um, there is always thought to everyone involved and um, always um, an acknowledgement of diversity and inclusion. So. Um, I'm a big fan so far. It's been an unusual start to a job, to be sure, um, but it's going well. Uh, yes, it has been an unusual start, and uh, I'm <laughs> glad to see you're persevering through it. So glad you're able to do that. So welcome to both of you. Liz Junwei, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, if, if and when we're back together again, I hope uh, you get the opportunity to meet you face to face. But welcome to the city of Bloomington. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Yep. Thank you.
And thank you, Ms. Henderson, for the introduction. On to item 5.2 in our introductory items. And we have our survey results in from our 2021 resident survey. An annual survey we've been doing for a number of years now and yes. looks like some interesting results once again. Diane Kirby is our community yeah. services director. She's gonna lead us through this. Well, good evening, Mayor and City Council. As the mayor mentioned, we have been doing this a number of year, years. In fact, this is our 10th anniversary. We have been doing the National Community Survey of Bloomington residents every single year since 2012. So this is your 10th survey results that I'm gonna be presenting to you right now. So let me get started by giving you a little bit of background about the National Community Survey. And I can get it to advance. And perhaps I will rely on Amy to help me advance my slides. So if you wanna go ahead and advance. Uh, a little bit about the National Community Survey. This is a random sample scientific survey conducted annually in Bloomington by Polco and the National Research Center out of Boulder, Colorado. There are 3,600 households that re received an invitation to fill out the survey this year. The survey was made available in both English and Spanish, and the polling took place between April 20th and June 8th of this year. Now, this was a hybrid survey. About two-thirds of the households received an invitation to fill out the survey via mail, a paper survey, and then one-third received an invitation to fill out the survey online. We had a total of 732 surveys that were completed. There was a margin of error of plus or minus 4% and a 95% confidence level. Now, there was also an open participation opt-in survey that was conducted online that anybody could fill out that attracted 136 responses, and the results from that survey are being kept separate from our random sample survey. Um, other things uh, that we did do with this particular survey is we've got both uh, the results that we can cross-tabulate by both geographic, by council district, as well as demographically, by gender, race, ethnicity, age, rent, or own a household, or annual household income. Next slide. So a key benefit of the National Community Survey is that it allows us to benchmark our results against the National Research Center's database of communities from across the country. They have over 500 communities that are in their database that we can compare our results against. And we also receive rankings against peer cities that we have selected. You'll notice on the slide that there is a cluster of dots in Minnesota. And so we have selected 29 cities, what we call our peer cities, similar to Bloomington, that we compare ourselves against. As well, and many of those are in Bloomington, or are in Minnesota. So we had 14 cities in Minnesota that we are comparing ourselves against, including Egan, Eden Prairie, Edina, Plymouth, Richfield, and Woodbury. Next slide. So there were 145 categories in this year's standard questionnaire. And there were 102, 22 ratings that were similar to 2020. 17 ratings increased above the margin of error of 4%. And they included areas such as impact of the economy on family income, fire services, street cleaning, stormwater management, and public places where people want to spend time. Uh, six areas did see a ratings decrease this year below the margin of error. And those were feeling safe from property crime, ease of travel by public transportation, use public transportation, volunteer time to a local group or activity, availability of affordable quality mental health care, and watched a local meeting online. And I will tell you that rating did drop from 30% that reported in 2020 to 25% in 2021. Next slide. And as I mentioned before, we are also able to benchmark our results against cities and counties in the NRC's national database. 22 categories had higher or much higher ratings in the national benchmark in 2021. Higher ratings, uh, areas where we saw much higher ratings included snow removal, drinking water, employment opportunities, land use, planning and zoning, and traffic flow on major streets. Only five areas rated lower than the national benchmark. And those lower ratings were volunteer time to a group or activity in Bloomington, watched a local public meeting, overall opportunities for education, culture, and the arts, how much the city should focus on the overall design of Bloomington's residential and commercial areas, and residents' connection and engagement with the community. Next slide. 
So let me tell you about some of the specific findings from this year's survey with our key finding number one, respondents continue to view Bloomington's quality of life very favorably. Next slide. When asked about their quality of life, 91% of respondents rated it as excellent or good. And this is similar to last year's rating. And the score is in the upper one third of the national benchmark. Next slide. Bloomington as a place to live remains steady at 91% and your neighborhood as a place to live inched up to 88%. And the overall image or reputation of Bloomington came in at 75%. Next slide. Respondents who said they plan to remain in Bloomington for the next five years was up slightly from 2020 at 87%. And those who would recommend Bloomington to someone who asked remain stable at 90%. Next slide. The scores for Bloomington as a place to raise children came in at 86%, remaining relatively stable from last year's rating. Satisfaction rating for Bloomington as a place to retire was unchanged. And the 74% approval rating is good enough to rank it in the top one third of jurisdictions in the national benchmark. Bloomington as a place to visit came in at 78% within the top one third of jurisdictions nationwide. Next slide. Our key finding number two from this year's survey. Residents continue to identify safety as an important focus area for the city and scores here remain strong in most areas. Next slide. Overall feeling of safety remained relatively unchanged at 80% in 2021. That overall score is similar to the national benchmark. Feeling safe in your neighborhood during the day held steady from last year at 96%. And feeling safe in Bloomington's commercial areas during the day was unchanged from 2020 at 88%. Next slide. Feeling safe from property crime did drop below the margin of error this year from 83% in 2020 to 75% in 2021. This score is actually similar to the early days of when we started administering the survey to the scores we saw in 2012 and in 2013. It was also similar to the national benchmark. Feeling safe from violent crime dropped to 84% in 2021, but was still within the margin of error. And feeling safe from fire, flood, and other natural disasters was unchanged this year. Next slide. When it comes to public safety, ratings for nearly all services increased this year. The police score improved by 3%, ranking it in the top one quarter of all jurisdictions nationwide. Crime prevention remained stable at 78%. And the rating for fire services rose by 5% this year, tying for an all-time high of 97%. Nationally, the satisfaction rating for fire placed Bloomington in the top 20% of cities and counties nationwide and among the top one quarter of our peer cities. Next slide. Key finding number three, Bloomington's economy continues to bring in high ratings among residents. And there was good news this year about respondents' personal finances. Next slide. A number of ratings within the e economy area were higher than ratings observed in the national benchmark, including overall quality of Bloomington's business and services, which ranked number 35 in the national database. Bloomington is a place to work. Shopping opportunities ranks 36 nationally. Variety of business services ranked number 14 nationally. And employment op opportunities ranked 13 nationally. Most scores in economy have remained stable over time. Next slide. This next question asked what impact, if any, the economy would have on family income in the next six months. Last year, those responding that the impact would be very or somewhat positive dropped by 14% from 29% in 2019 to 15% in 2020. This year, though, this question made a remarkable turnaround with 31% of respondents stating that their economic impact would be very or somewhat positive on their family income. Next slide. The score for overall design and layout of Bloomington's residential and commercial areas increased slightly to 75% in 2021. That's good enough to rank it in the top 20% in the nationwide database and number four among our peer cities. With a 68% approval rating, the variety of housing options in Bloomington ranked among the top 15% of cities in the nationwide benchmark. And when it comes to the availability of affordable quality housing, the score remained unchanged at 48%, but that was good enough to rank it in the top one third of ju jurisdictions in the NRC's national database. Next slide. In the category of built environment, new development earned excellent or good ratings from 64% of respondents. 
Well-designed neighborhoods was a new question last year, and its score of 72% was unchanged from 2020. Overall appearance of Bloomington was virtually unchanged at 75%, and all of these scores were similar to other communities in the national benchmark. Next slide. Within the city government area, the scores in 2021 remained strong. And let's take a look at those. Next slide. Bloomington's overall direction slipped some from the 2020 to 67%, but that was still within the margin of error. And this score placed Bloomington in the top one third of jurisdictions nationwide. The rating for overall confidence in city government was similar to last year's score, 67%. And this ranked Bloomington in the top one quarter of communities nationwide. And when it comes to the city's overall customer service, this rating continues to improve, rising a total of 6% since 2019. That 88% score places Bloomington in the top 25% of communities in the national database, and it also exceeds the city council's customer service goal of 85% within the strategic priority of high quality service delivery, and that's for the second year in a row. Next slide. In these ratings on various aspects of the city's governance, two areas rose above the margin of error in 2021, and they were treating all residents fairly, which rose by 6% to 72%, and informing residents about issues increased by 5% to 68%. And I also want to point out that eight of these categories were in the top one quarter of jurisdictions in the NRC's national database. They were value of services for taxes paid to Bloomington, services provided by Bloomington, treating all residents fairly, generally acting in the best interest of the community, informing residents about issues, overall confidence in Bloomington gover government, value of services for taxes paid, and the job Bloomington does at welcoming resident involvement. Next slide. Ratings for specific city services generally remain stable from 2021, with the exception of emergency preparedness, which increased by 8% to 82% this year. Scores for the city services listed here were comparable to their national benchmarks, with the exception of natural areas preservation, animal control, and land use planning and zoning. All three scored higher than the benchmark in the national database, and preservation of natural areas actually ranked number eight in the nationwide database of jurisdictions and third in our group of peer cities. Next slide. Our next key finding from this year's survey, scores for mobility and utility-related services continue to shine. Next slide. In the area of street repair, after rising by 14% in 2020, the score for street repair settled back a little bit at 58% in 2021. That's still the second highest rating ever in this category in 10 years. And this was good enough to place street repair in the top one third of communities nationwide. The area of snow removal, after jumping by 5% to 82% last year, snow removal increased again this year to 85%. That's higher than the national benchmark. It also moved up in the rankings from number 25 of all jurisdictions in 2020 to number 12 in 2021. And it also placed number three in our peer cities comparison. And in the area of street cleaning, that grew by 6% to 86% in 2021, good enough to place it at number 17 of jurisdictions nationwide and number two among our peer cities. Next slide. In other mobility-related categories, ease of travel by car in Bloomington remained at 84% this year. That score ranks it in the top 20% nationwide and number four in the peer cities rankings. Ease of walking in Bloomington was unchanged at 74%, similar to the national benchmark. And ease of travel by bicycle in Bloomington came in at 63%. That's good enough to place it in the top one-third of jurisdictions nationally. Next slide. Now, utilities is an area where Bloomington has traditional, traditionally done very, very well in the National Community Survey, and it continued to do so in 2021. Respondents poured out their praise for Bloomington's drinking water. The 2021 rating of 93% is an all-time high for this area. That places it much higher than the national benchmark, moving from number three among jurisdictions nationwide in 2020 to number two in 2021 and number one against our group of peer cities. Under the area of stormwater management, after increasing by 12% last year, stormwater management again rose above the margin of error to 92% in 2021. It came in at number 45 nationwide and number one in the peer cities comparisons. And under the area of sewer services, with a score of 93%, 
sewer services was higher than the national benchmark. It moved from number 10 to number six in the national comparisons and number two among our peer cities. Next slide. When it comes to other utility-related services, scores for all of these services shown here remain steady this year within the margin of error. Garbage collection received an excellent or good ratings from 83% of respondents, a 3% increase in 2021, and recycling came in at 81%. Yard waste pickup posted an all-time high for the second year in a row of 86%. Next slide. Our fifth key finding from this year's survey, Bloomington's wellness and recreation opportunities are really valued by Bloomington residents. Next slide. Starting with health and wellness, the scores in this category remain stable from 2020, with the exception of the availability of affordable quality mental health care, which dropped by 5% in 2021. And I want to note that all of these categories came in at the top one third of jurisdictions nationwide. Next slide. One of the ways residents stayed healthy this past year was by taking advantage of the city's parks and recreational opportunities. 89% of respondents again rated the overall quality of parks and recreation opportunities in Bloomington as excellent or good. 87% of residents were pleased with the availability of paths and walking trails, of a total of 11% since 2019. And recreational opportunities inched up to 81% in 2021. Next slide. Now the ratings for city parks dropped slightly this year to 87%. Recreation programs or classes rose by 8% in 2021 to 86%, and 74% of respondents rated recreation centers or facilities as excellent or good. Next slide. Our key finding number six from the 2021 survey, attitudes toward diversity and inclusion have improved over the past year. Next slide. In the area of inclusivity and engagement, while many of the ratings here re remain steady, several increased by more than the margin of error. Attracting people from diverse backgrounds increased from 71% in 2020 to 79% in 2021. Opportunities to volunteer increased by 9% in 2021. And openness and acceptance of the community toward people of diverse backgrounds increased from 61% in 2020 to 68% in 2021. Also, you'll note that attracting people from diverse backgrounds ranked higher than other communities in the national database. Next slide. Respondents who rated the sense of community and civic pride in Bloomington as excellent or good rose by 3% in 2021 to 65%. And this is similar to the national benchmark. Next slide. In the area of education, arts, and culture, Overall opportunities for education, culture, and the arts scored 81% excellent or good ratings, up slightly from 2020. Community support for the arts received a score of 68%, down 4% this year. And nearly three quarters of respondents scored K through 12 education in Bloomington as excellent or good, and that is similar to last year's rating. Next slide. Finally, there were three custom questions from last year's community survey that were, again, included on this year's poll. They were related to community inclusivity, the impacts of COVID-19, and city priorities. Next slide. This first question covered residents' perception of community inclusivity. The question was, how welcoming, if at all, do you think your community is to the following groups? Nearly all scores in this category improved, with the exception of people who are Asian, Asian Indian, or Pacific Islander. Nearly all respondents thought that the community was very or moderately welcoming to people who identify as white. But the scores for, for being welcoming to people who are Asian, Asian Indian, or Pacific Islander was down 6% from 2020 at 80%. The scores for people who are Hispanic or Latino, Latino improved by 6% to 80%. For people who are American, Indian, or Alaskan Native rose by 8% this year. People who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, straight, or other non-straight sexual identities stayed stable this year at 76%. For how welcoming the community is to people who are black or African American, that grew by 11% from 65% in 2020 to 76% in 2021. People who are Arabic or Middle Eastern, this category improved from 61% to 69% this year. And people whose first language isn't English rose by 5% to 67%. People who identify as transgender remain the same as last year, and people who are not U.S. citizen, 
That grew by 3% to 64% this year. Next slide. This next question asked, how much of a priority, if at all, should it be for the city of Bloomington to focus on each of the following areas? And we saw two rise to the top. 83% uh, of respondents scored, as a, scored these two as being of, of high priority or moderate priority, and they were addressing social, economic, and racial equity differences in the criminal justice system and in education. That was followed by addressing differences in housing at 82% and creating a diverse, inclusive, and fair community at 82%. Next slide. And this final question focused on the impact of COVID-19 in Bloomington households. It asked respondents to rate how much of a problem, if at all, the following issues were to them. Loss of employment income was a major or moderate problem for 21% of respondents. That's down from 26% in 2020. 18% reported that loss of income from retirement savings was a major or moderate problem, down 8% from 2020. And loss of housing was a major or moderate problem for 6% six, for 6 of respondents. That's down from 10% in 2020. Next slide. When it came to the lack of paid sick leave or time off benefits from employers, 12% reported that it was a major or moderate problem in 2021, and that's down 6% from 2020. Next slide. So that's just a quick overview of the results from the 2021 National Community Survey of Bloomington residents. The full survey re results are posted on our city website at bloomingtonmn.gov and just search for 2021 survey to find the full report. And I will stand for questions now. Thank you, Ms. Kirby. I'm glad to hear that Bloomington is rocking it in sewer services. That's good to it know. It really is. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Well done, Carl. Well done. Uh, two questions that I have. One, and, and I'll ask you because I guarantee we're going to be asked it or we'll see it and post it on Facebook or social media or I'll get asked it personally. I guarantee you somebody's going to come forward and say, well, you only had 700 people answer this. You, you didn't ask me these questions. How can this be at all valid? In a city of 90,000 people, 700 people answer a survey. How can that be valid? Mm -hmm. How would you answer that? And, and mayor and city council, I mean, this is actually, as I mentioned, this was uh, a 95% confidence level. So they have a way of doing this when they randomize surveys, um, asking people, and they, they take every nth number of households. Um, they're able to, with a 95% confidence level, they're able to, to replicate that and say that, Generally, the community feels the same way. The rest of the so statistically significant, statistically exactly. valid, um, exactly scientific, scientific, the whole the whole bit. Good, I appreciate that, and I just think that's important to keep repeating because I, that, that will be we've heard it before, and I guarantee yeah. it'll be a, a question brought up again. The second question I had a, a bit more, uh, not not as specific, but uh, what what was seen nationally, and and what does the community survey the, the national folks who are working on this? Wh what do they see? the 2021 results compared to the complete aberration that 2020 was as opposed to 2019. I mean, I'm looking at hearing some of the, the changes that, that you brought forward, mm -hmm. the people with less, who, who used uh, public transit less. Well, of course they used public transit less and, or they, that were more dissatisfied with public transit because it wasn't running basically over for the good, better part of 18 months. Do they have a way of quantifying or, or bundling up or, or kind of, how, how are they comfortable with these results compared to such an, a strange year in 2020? And uh, is it more accurate to compare them to 2019? Yeah, Mayor and City Council, you know, I think what's interesting is that if you recall last year, we actually conducted the survey at a later date. Normally we will conduct this survey in the May, June timeframe. And we do that every year. Um, last year because of COVID-19 and the pandemic, and we knew that people were, their minds were elsewhere, right? They were thinking about other things last year. And so we ended up conducting the survey in August and September of last year. And I think what you're seeing actually is kind of interesting that the trends here are, are good. And uh, we've seen some, some nice improvements in some areas, especially under community engagement and inclusivity uh, over the past year, which is pretty remarkable given the past year. So I have not heard yet what the National Research Center is seeing across the country in terms of the surveys that they've been doing. But I just think it's been, been interesting to see that um, our ratings have pretty much held up and we're seeing some real nice improvements. Like I mentioned, household income, another area that rebounded really nicely 
in this survey. So that was good to see. Absolutely. And, and, and overall, uh, good survey results. It was, it was uh, good were. to see once again that uh, uh, it affirms the work I think that there, our city staff does and, and the direction overall that we're taking here in the city. So, Council, any questions? Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, one question, uh, I got two questions here. Um, first one is around uh, the peer cities. Who are these uh, peer cities? You know, we I just realized we didn't even say who they are again this year. Yes, Council Member Lohman and Mayor and City Council. They are actually cities that we've identified as, uh, we, we like to compare ourselves against Minnesota cities, so we've been adding those in throughout the years. Um, but these are other cities across the country that are, are actually high performing cities that we like to compare ourselves against. They may have similar characteristics as we do in, in terms of being close to transportation corridors, uh, close to an airport. Um, and so they have similar characteristics that, that Bloomington has. Could you give us a couple of examples? A couple so of examples that I can think of right off the top of my head. Uh, one example is Arvada, uh, Colorado. And I believe another one that we've included in the rankings uh, is uh, Bellevue, Washington. So that I kind of give you, and when, in, when you go in to look at this online, you'll be able to look and see specifically which ones there are in Minnesota, just, just if, you're, if you're watching and, and you're looking for that. And so just to uh, have a better understanding for our residents that see this, I mean, we've got number one in drinking water, which I just absolutely love that. But um, I'm not sure how many years we've had that, but help us understand you know, what that means to be ranked number one nationally with that. How many cities are we talking about? What does it take to, to, to get that kind of rating with that? Yeah, Council Member Lohman and Mayor and City Council, that's a fantastic ranking actually. When you're talking about of all the communities that ask that particular question, and that's well over in excess of 400 communities that ask about their drinking water, to come in at number one, is very impressive, especially given just the, the breadth of communities across the country that are, that are uh, utilizing the National Community Survey. So it's pretty impressive. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Well, Councilmember Lohman set me up nicely on that one because I want to ask about <laughs> drinking water too. Because in fact, we were number two nationally on drinking yeah. water. And so I'm going to ask the question that I know we're all dying to ask. Do we know who's number one and what do we need to do to get them <laughs> out of that top spot uh, maybe I, the second question is a better question for carl yes uh, council member coulter and mayor and city council i do not know the answer to that. <laughs> sorry about it's that totally fine <laughs> but we should seriously find that out because <laughs> um, <laughs> um on a on a more serious note you know you you one thing that caught my ear was the um the the perception of of inclusivity and I'm, I'm really glad to see those numbers go up but the one exception to that was the asian american pacific islander community and i'm wondering i mean we know nationally that you know that is on the rise largely unfortunately because of covid i mean are we seeing that kind of thing kind of across the board that's not like that that drop is not specific i'm sure to the city of bloomington correct so council member coulter and and uh, Mayor and City Council, you remember that that's actually a custom question that we ask. So there are not other communities that are asking that gotcha. question. But I'm, I'm yeah, I, I can't speculate on the reason for that, but yeah. Okay, well, you, you can't, but I obviously just did. Yeah. Um, and then, I, you know, I don't know, my, the last, maybe it's just a sort of an idle musing, but I'm, I'm curious if you have any explanation for, you know, I mean, we have a great fire service. I have no question about that. But it's not like we saw more fires than usual last year. Can, I mean, what, do you have any idea what the explanation is? Or suddenly people just more aware of it? Or, or what's going on with that? Yeah, Council Member Coulter and Mayor and City Council Members. Uh, it, perhaps Fire Chief Uli Seal would be better able <laughs> to answer that question at another date. But um, clearly people love, love our, our fire department services. And he may have more insights <laughs> than I would have on that. Well, thank you. No, I, 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 that was just in... in <laughs> interesting note to me and I, I was just curious about that thank you i see that our chief uh yuli seal has popped on <laughs> chief seal would you like to comment on that at all i've never heard chief seal on mute before <laughs> all right we'll have to catch up with chief seal at a later date then Council members, any additional questions, comments on this? Well, if not, uh, I, I would 
urge everyone who is interested to go and read this online. And all of the information that we have in our packet and all the information you heard tonight is available on the website. Uh, it, and it, it lays it out. I see you, Jack. We'll get to you in just one second. Uh, it lays it out, and it's, it's interesting, and it, it allows you to, to compare between cities and see the breakdown. And, it, and it's good, and it's interesting stuff. And I really do encourage people, dig in, take a look at it, and uh, take a look for yourself and, and see, um, see, see where it all falls. And it's, it's just uh, it, it's time well spent. I know I spent quite a bit of time uh, the last couple of days just looking through all of the different categories and breaking them down and looking at where the, uh, where the breaks came and where the different levels of, of, uh, of, of uh, satisfaction were and different things. It, it, it's interesting stuff. So I would really encourage people, if, if you get the opportunity, if you get the chance, uh, if you're curious at all, dig in. It's, it's right there, and it's all right in front of you. So please don't hesitate to do that. Council Member Beloga, and then I see Council Member uh, Carter as well. Council Member Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good presentation. Appreciate the uh, information. Uh, lots of it, and it's, uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, these surveys contain lots and lots of details. So appreciate you synthesizing it in the way that you do. Um, I suspect that we'll be getting a hard copy of this at some point in the future, as we have in the past. And is it now on the website available for folks? It is. Yes, Great. Council Member Beloga, it is online right now. Uh, excellent, thank you. Um, and then lastly, um, there were a few points that I didn't pick up on your presentation. So uh, if I could see, if you could uh, give us a copy of the deck that you used for your presentation, uh, I would appreciate it because uh, uh, with the rapidity that we're going here because of time, it's uh, hard to catch all the finer points. So would appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And this uh, question might actually be more for Mr. Verbergi. Uh, so, is this information going to be used in the community-based or the community-based strategic planning process as kind of background information or um, information as we kind of start to think about priorities as a community? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Carter, that's a very good question. The answer is yes. Uh, in anticipation of the core planning team coming together in early December, staff will be uh, assembling what we call a data book that will have uh, a, a great amount of information about the community, and the community survey is a really important piece of that, so it will definitely be included in their materials. Thank you. That's my only question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any additional? And just for clarification, now this is our, our community survey, but there's also a business survey that we're going to be talking about very, I think, later this month as well. Is that true? Yeah, yes, Mayor. There is another survey coming up that you'll be getting the results for shortly. Yes. And that's specifically, different vendors. specifically with our business community and, and their, uh, their, their attitudes and feelings toward uh, the city of Bloomington as well. So that to look forward to. Well, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. as always. It's, uh, it's, it's always interesting to, to see this information and appreciate it. Thanks. Moving on to item 5.3 in our agenda. This is our mission moment. We're gonna talk about uh, community-based strategic planning. We have been uh, spending time at uh, recent council meetings kind of going through items related to our mission. I think we've talked about uh, our equity and inclusion uh, strategic initiative over the past couple of meetings. And I know that this relates to that and to many others as well, our community-based strategic planning. Um, the, the whole notion of our, our mission moment, the mission, the strategic priorities that we put together are now five years old, and we're looking at uh, revising and updating and trying to find the best way forward to, to reset those or to uh, update those to reflect the community today, and that's what this planning process is. Mr. Verbrugge, if you can give us an update on this. Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, this will be a relatively short uh, update. I want to thank uh, Council Member Carter for asking that last question. Um, because it fits in uh, perfectly as a segue to this topic. So as the mayor said, uh, we are starting a new strategic planning process. And what's different about this strategic planning process is it is, in a, it is a, um, an explicit effort to create what I would refer to as an, an intended future for the city of Bloomington and that we are doing that in partnership with uh, residents of this community. So what do I mean by that? Uh, we are going to, as I just referenced before, uh, bring together a core planning team that will be equal parts city, 
uh, representatives and community members, probably about 15 of each for a total of about 30 people on the core planning team. So somebody may say, well, well, geez, I'd maybe like to participate in that. That sounds pretty cool. So how could I do that? Well, on our website, uh, on the front page, there is uh, information about this community-based strategic planning process. And we've, we've uh, titled it Bloomington Tomorrow Together. And so uh, if you click on there, you'll see an opportunity to uh, fill out an application that uh, will allow people to indicate their intent if they wish to participate in the core planning team or in any other capacity during this process. So let me talk about some of those opportunities that will be available. The very first opportunity will be as a member of the larger community. We will have a series of community cafes in October of this year, including uh, one day, October um, Diane, 23rd? 16th, thank you. <laughs> October 16th, Saturday, we will have three community cafes. They will be at Kennedy High School. Uh, there'll be facilitated conversations, and we're going to be mining uh, from our residents uh, feedback on a number of questions, things that they value in the community, uh, things that they uh, see as maybe challenges in the community, things they'd like to see more of that we don't have here if there are gaps, uh, those kinds of conversations so that we can get a good sense of uh, what people think about Bloomington, what their hopes and aspirations are for the future. Uh, and we will assemble all of that information. We'll do other community cafes too. We'll be doing them around the community, but those are the three big ones. Uh, we'll assemble all that information into what I refer to as the data book. And in early December, the core planning team will come together. And that team will uh, spend time uh, laying out the overarching mission and strategic objectives. Then there are two other teams. There's an action planning, there are action planning teams. There'll be one team for each of the strategic objectives that are identified by the core planning team. And there's also a measurement team. So we can have um, very clear, measurable, articulated goals uh, for those strategic objectives um, that we will track and we will monitor so that we know that we're making progress. So on that uh, page on the website, in addition to uh, having the application for the core planning team, you can also apply to be on one of the action teams or one of the uh, measurements team, on the measurement team as well. So um, these are really great opportunities. So what are we looking for in terms of our applicants from the community? Uh, what we're looking for are people, one, who uh, more than anything else care about the future of this community, right? And so it's somebody who really believes strongly in the future of Bloomington. We want folks who are, uh, who are or can be respected members of the community, that within whether their own affinity groups or their, uh, you know, their own network within the community, they are seen as a person of, um, a, person of uh, a good intent and uh, commitment. And we also want to make sure that we have uh, representation that reflects all of Bloomington. So we'll be uh, interviewing the applicants that we get and ultimately putting that team together uh, probably in uh, mid to late October. And then, like I said, we'll start the teamwork in December. Uh, all of this will culminate in a recommendation from uh, the city manager back to the city council on what that future... Uh, um, looks like what the mission and the, and the strategies are, uh, and that will occur in the first quarter of 2022. So that's the process. Like I say, look for those community cafes. It's really a great opportunity to sit down and engage in conversation with your neighbors in a facilitated conversation. Um, people walk out of there, I think, feeling, one, like their voice has been heard, but two, often making connections that they hadn't made before. It's a good way to get to know other people in the community, and it's a good way to make sure that your input is reflected as we start to consider what the future of Bloomington looks like. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Brugge. Council, any questions on this? Kind of laid out in front of us, and I think we can expect Within the next 60 days or so here, the wheel starting to turn to, um, or starting to turn a bit more quickly and more expeditiously on this, and we'll, we'll see this move forward. Thank you for that. Mr. Babrugge, appreciate it. Oh, Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I just have a couple questions. Uh, so you said that there would be interviews and that, um, you said we would be doing interviews, and I'm just curious who is doing interviews and who is kind of deciding, making the decisions. Sure, Mr. Mayor and uh, 
council members, council member Carter, uh, we will have uh, primarily staff members that will be doing the interviewing. We'll be uh, having teams of um, staff. And so uh, I'm expecting that we're going to get a lot of applicants. I know that we already have 30 so far, which is a great number. Uh, and I expect we're probably going to get two or three times that many. Uh, so that's an awful lot of people to be interviewed by just one group of employees. So we will have multiple groups of employees that are interviewing folks. And then we will uh, sit down and everybody will have some agreed upon criteria and we'll work out what everybody heard from the interviewing uh, candidates and we'll put the team together that way. So the, the groups that are interviewing folks uh, will make the recommendations up to me and ultimately it'll be the city manager's appointments to be on the core planning team. Okay. Um and then can you talk a little bit about what uh, the council's role will look like other sure. than kind of approving the final recommendations? Will we be involved in the process or? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Carter, I think there are three uh, really important ways that you can be involved. Uh, one, participating in the community cafes uh, and uh, having other people see that you're participating, right? We wanna make sure that other folks know that you're invested in the future as much as they are. Um, second, there will be three council members uh, who will be on the core planning team. And uh, I would also invite council members uh, to be a part of the action teams or the um, measurement team if that is of interest to council members. And then the third really important role is just to be an advocate and champion for this process. And um, tapping into your networks and encouraging other people to get involved and to participate uh, as much as they can. Great, thank you. Uh, another question I have, um, so for people who uh, maybe have mobility issues and can't go to the community cafes or uh, maybe even have some technology challenges, so may need like an application mail to them, are we doing, what kind of accommodations do we have in place so that, um, you know, we're just kind of keeping the pro process as accessible as possible? It's an excellent question. Um, so if somebody's not able to make it to the community cafe, we're making sure that we are providing opportunities for uh, folks to provide their input uh, either virtually or electronically. Uh, we'll utilize the Let's Talk Bloomington page on our website uh, to get feedback that way. Uh, and I believe we're going to have the same questions that we are using at the community cafes on the Let's Talk Bloomington page. And then um, that will probably be a relatively brief period just because we have to turn around that data just as quickly as we turn around the other data. Um, but we'll make sure that folks know about that. Uh, and secondly, I think we're going to do at least one virtual town hall type community cafe so that uh, folks who want to participate sort of in person but can't be live and in person will at least have an opportunity to do that. And then the last uh, thing I'd say is that um, if people uh, do have um, special needs or need accommodations for the community cafes themselves uh, to make sure that they contact staff, uh, whether that is uh, somebody to provide interpretive services for them uh, or if they have mobility challenges, that we will uh, do everything we can to accommodate people's special needs. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. I'm super excited for this, though. It's going to be great. And I know that residents are really excited. I've heard from many people. So thank you. Any additional questions, comments? Council? Hearing none, thank you. We will move on. And we will move on to our consent business. And item six is our consent agenda. Council Member Beloga, you have a consent business this evening. Council Member, I believe you're on mute. Thank you uh, doubly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I've been informed by the city manager that there were no comments with respect to hold or consent business, but last call. Okay, not seeing any. Uh, I move for approval item 6.1 through 6.11. Second. We have, a motion. we have a motion by Council Member Beloga, second by Council Member Lohman to accept the tonight's uh, consent agenda. Hearing no further council questions or comments, Mr. Brillard. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Moving on to item 7.3, as we have already covered item 7.1 and 7.2 earlier this evening, 7.3, 
It's a resolution to a, uh, looking at a feasibility report and a uh, resolution to order the Xerxes Avenue and Old Shakopee Road intersection improvements, that entire project, and to authorize and direct staff to set just compensation and make offers for easement acquisition. Uh, Darren Rizek, our from our civil engineering office, is here this evening to lead us through this. Good evening, Mr. All right, thank, thank you, Mayor and members of council. I do have a presentation for you. All right, uh, so this is the public hearing for city project 2022-201. Uh, Xerxes Avenue and Old Chalkbee Road Intersection Improvement Project. Again, I'm Darren Rizak, civil engineer with our engineering division. Also on the line, we have Public Works Director Carl Keel, City Engineer Julie Long, and Senior Civil Engineer Bob Simons. Uh, so a little background. So the City of Bloomington, in partnership with Hennepin County, is proposing safety improvements at the intersection of Old Chalkbee Road and Xerxes Avenue. Uh, currently, Old Chalkby Road is under Hennepin County jurisdiction, and it sees about 22,500 vehicles per day. Xerxes Avenue is under Bloomington jurisdiction and averages about 2,500 vehicles per day north of the intersection and 7,400 vehicles south of the intersection. Uh, during a time period from 2013 to uh, 2015, the intersection experienced 23 reported crashes, and 50% of those crashes were right angle or left turn into crashes. And these statistics were high enough to classify it as a prioritized urban intersection by Hennepin County's roadway safety plan. Um, so the installation of the left turn lanes on all approaches of the intersection provides significant crash reduction by moving those left turning vehicles out of the through lanes, which they currently make their uh, turning movements from. So with a uh, need for safety improvements identified, the city submitted a highway safety improvement program grant application for the project with support from Hennepin County in 2018. In February of 2019, the city received word um, that it would receive federal funding for 2022 fiscal year construction do dollars. Uh, we came before the council, or there's an uh, agenda item at the March 22nd meeting of this year, where the council ordered the preparation of a feasibility study for the project. On uh, June 24th of this year, city uh, engineering staff, we held a neighborhood meeting at Westwood Elementary School. And that brings us tonight, the public hearing at the Bloomington City Council. Uh, some design highlights. So the main thing is going to be uh, the installation of dedicated left turn lanes on all approaches of the intersection. Uh, Hennepin County will ultimately be the owner and operator of the traffic signal, so they will be evaluating if uh, allowing flashing yellow arrow turning movements will be allowed, and that will be uh, determined later on when the project is developed. Um, due to the traffic volumes on Old Chalkby Road, we, will, we are proposing maintaining two through lanes of traffic on Old Chalkby Road in both directions. Um, in order to accommodate the geometric changes to the intersection, the city is proposing to um, do a new traffic signal, and that new traffic signal would include the APS push buttons on all quadrants. Um, any sidewalk within the project corridor is proposed to uh, have five foot minimum sidewalk uh, sidewalks reinstalled, which is the city standard width. And then any pedestrian curb ramps uh, also within the project corridor will be upgraded to be an ADA compliance. Um, we are also proposing a mill and overlay on Old Chalkby Road from York Avenue on the west to Washburn Avenue on the east. Um, and then included in the agenda packet, the feasibility study. So the, the first alternative that the city investigated was um, taking that, uh, using kind of a more northerly alignment through the intersection, um, which would have only impacted properties on the north side of Old Shakopee Road. But during our preliminary engineering, it uh, became apparent that the affected properties would have resulted in, or the impacts of those properties would have resulted in a much greater reduction in usable uh, front yard space abutting Old Shakopee Road, and the driveway slopes that we would have had to reinstall would have exceeded the allowable limits under the Bloomington City Code. So we kind of did another... Uh, well, we did another iteration and we did a more centered alignment through the intersection there. So with this, we do have property impacts on both the north and south side of the intersection, but those impacts are much less significant than the uh, alternative one that was laid out in the feasibility study. Uh, 
Um, this work uh, with kind of sliding it to the south a little bit, the, the south curb line and, side lock and sidewalks will be impacted um, and we will need to, we are proposing to bump those out um, in order to accommodate the cross section throughout the uh, corridor. So project cost, so we have uh, budgeted or we have our, our preliminary estimate right now has construction at about $860,000, uh, 20% contingency, um, a 22% project administration. And then we have a, uh, we, we do have seven parcels that we will have to have uh, easement acquisition. And I will go into that in a later slide. And we have that budgeted at uh, 200,000 for a project grant total of $1.5 million. Uh, the funding sources are at the bottom table there. Hennepin County is or is proposing to contribute $325,000. Uh, Bloomington will be using our local state aid dollars and local utility dollars. Uh, that is uh, $611,000. And then the federal grant is at about $563,000. So right away acquisition, we have identified seven parcels uh, that will require um, sidewalk and utility easements. Um, these same seven parcels, we also need to acquire or, uh, or get temporary construction easements for the duration of the construction project. Um, engineering staff has already uh, met on the on site with the seven property owners. We went out there and met with them in the spring of 2021 to explain the project and the property acquisition process. Uh, the city has also hired an independent appraiser to prepare the before and after uh, construction valuations for those seven properties. Um, and then the, I guess the, the second motion included in the agenda packet is to have the city council approve the just compensation figures and to authorize and direct staff to make offers for easement acquisition. Um, if this motion passes, staff will share the appraisal reports with the property owners and begin the negotiations for the easements. Uh, so yeah, so uh, originally in spring of 2021, we did send the uh, mailers to the seven parcels with the right away acquisition. Uh, we met out there in April of 2021 to go over the project with them. Um, we did use the city's uh, Let's Talk Bloomington page um, to kind of explain the project and um, kind of start our, our outreach efforts from there. Um, we did send postcards to 1,200 properties, inviting them to our open house and the Let's Talk Bloomington page. And that 1,200 properties represents basically a, a half mile radius from the intersection. Um, on June 24th, we held our open house at Westwood Elementary School. And our sign-in sheet had uh, 36 attendees that, uh, that came out that night. Um, and the comment cards are also included in the agenda packet. And then on July 21st, we sent uh, postcards to that same 1,200 properties, inviting them to the uh, public hearing here tonight. Uh, so the next step, so the Highway Safety Improvement Plan grant that was awarded to the project, it's going to be administered through the MnDOT Federal Aid Office. So federal uh, federal projects do require some extra extra steps and extra documentation. So we are working through that right now, and we will be submitting that to MnDOT Federal Aid here um, in late summer, early fall, should the project be ordered. Um, and then if the second motion uh, is passed by council tonight, those appraisals that were uh, completed will be shared with the seven property owners, and we will begin negotiations with them. Uh, Bloomington engineering staff will be completing the design of the project in-house. Um, we are looking to have plans and specifications completed by late fall or early winter this year. Um, the plans and specifications will then be sent out to both MnDOT and Hennepin County for uh, their review of it. And then following the review of the plans and specifications um, and the acceptance of the federal project memorandum, the city would be looking to bid the project in March or April of 2022 timeframe with construction beginning in late spring, early summer. Uh, the project is expected to take one construction season to complete and would be substantially complete by fall of 2022. 
Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council members, I that is it for my presentation, and I will turn it back to you for questions. Thank you, Mr. Rizak. Council, questions on this? Council member uh, Coulter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Darren, thank you. Just a few quick questions here. Um, sort of to begin with, by the in terms of the background, you mentioned here there are a total of 23 crashes reported at that particular intersection. Uh, how does that compare to, say, other even other intersections around on Old Shakopee? You know, Old Shakopee in France or Normandale or you know, take your pick. How does or even farther west, say, like Bush Lake Road and, and that area? How does that compare? Do you know? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Coulter, I do not have that information right now. Okay, that I I think that would be helpful to know. Okay. Um, and then uh, you you kind of laid out here the next steps in the process after tonight. And uh, my first question is: Do any of those next steps would any of those next steps require council approval? Uh, Councilmember Coulter. Um... Mr. Mayor, I guess the, the next steps moving forward would be um, once the plans and specs are approved, we would we would ask you to um, approve the plans and specs as well as set the bidding schedule. Um, I guess Senior Civil Engineer Bob Simons, is there uh, requirements for the uh, easement acquisitions and, and approving that uh, those negotiations? Oh, okay. So I, I guess so, so what you're saying is that the, the plans and specs would come back to the the council for approval as well at some point in the future. Is that, am I understanding that yes. correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, okay, I think that re that really was my question there. Um, and then uh, moving forward, I'm I'm anticipating that there are a few residents here who wanna, uh, who have some questions and wanna talk about this tonight. After tonight, who is the best person who, where would those questions be directed? Uh, Council Member Coulter, uh, Mayor Bussey, members of the council, I am serving as the city's project manager, so I'm the one that will be uh, taking it through the federal documentation process as well as overseeing the design. And then uh, once construction starts, I will be um, being the project manager on that project as well. Okay, so I would, I would say to staff maybe then moving forward, assuming folks are, are uh, curious about this and want to keep following it to make sure that they have the, the proper contact information there as well. Um, and then my last question, you, you sort of touched on it a little bit, but um, could you, you know, there, you mentioned some of the alternatives that were discussed for this project. Could you talk a little bit about those and, and why they were not, why they're not being proposed here tonight? Uh, well, I guess the, the, the project um, was scored at the, uh, you know, the, the highway safety improvement program level. Uh, it was scored as a um, the inclusion of left turn lanes and all approaches on the uh, you know within the intersection. Um, so that that's how the how the grant was submitted and and how it was scored. And it is a regional solicitation, so we do compete against you know other projects within the area. Um, so I guess the the alternatives that were investigated were more the kind of the geometric. Um, how can we you know slide the uh, intersection north or south in order to reduce the impacts to those property owners along there. Uh, thank you. And then just a, a follow up here. It's noted in the packet, but um, I'm sure some folks are wondering um, why a, a roundabout was not discussed. And could you talk or not, why that's not the option that's being talked about tonight. Could you uh, discuss that a little bit too as well? Yes. Uh, Council Member Coulter, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, so the uh, traffic volumes on Old Shakopee Road, um, they would have required a, a multi-lane roundabout. Um, you know, you can see them. They have some of them uh, currently implemented in, in Richfield on 66th Street. Um, so in order to, uh, the, the footprint of a multi-lane roundabout um, would have required uh, basically the removal of, uh, you know, full, full takings of properties on Old Shakopee Road and on Xerxes Avenue. Um, so, so that in itself, um, as well as the um, roundabouts do also work best when there are uh, traffic volumes on all legs of the intersection that are roughly equal. Um, and right now uh, we have Old Chakby Road is, you know, 22,000 vehicles per day. And then 
Xerxes Avenue north of the intersection is 2,500 and Xerxes Avenue south of the intersection is 7,400. So um, there would have been significant delay at the at the intersection if uh, for those uh, motorists approaching from north or south on Xerxes Avenue. Thank you. And then just one one last question here in terms of uh, impact to the, the properties around this intersection. Um, I mean, is it is it fair to say that if not the sort of the lowest impact, this is among the lowest impact of, of the proposals that could move forward? Councilmember Coulter, Mr. Mayor, members of council, that is correct. We are uh, currently in the in the council packet, the the project layout in there that that does lay out the the cross sections through there. So we are at the uh, the minimums for as far as our our lane widths, um, our boulevard widths, and our our sidewalk widths. So um, you know we we tried to tighten that up as as much as we can through the through the project design. Wonderful. Thank you. Councilmember Beloga and then Councilmember Lohman. Councilmember Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Darren, when uh, we talked about traffic volumes and just about all other aspects of it, and then do a comparison of those numbers against the financial contributions between the city of Bloomington and Hennepin County, uh, the city of Bloomington is funding about $2 to every dollar of Hennepin County. And I'm just trying to get my mind around that. So I know there's uh, information that supports that. Can you share that with us? Councilmember Beloga, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So the, the cost share agreement that, that we have laid out in there. So we are still uh, working on our, I guess, our uh, negotiations with Hennepin County as far as uh, how much they are going to contribute for this project. Um, that dollar amount is, is what they have kind of presented to us as, as um, the dollar amount that they would be able to contribute. Um, I will say that, that we do have another uh, project, the Normandale Boulevard and 98th Street, um, which will be coming before council, and that will also be a, a 2022 project. And Hennepin County is uh, proposing to pay for about 90% of that project, with the city contributing 10%. Um, so it's it's not a I guess an equal spread between projects, but on that one they they will be contributing more than than what Bloomington is. Um, so when when we negotiate this, what are the key elements that we use? Uh, Councilmember Blow, could you repeat that again? Sure. Um, when, when you negotiate with Hennepin County on a project like this, what are the key elements that are considered? Well, I guess the, the key elements that we considered is the, the, the city did submit the grant for this. Um, we are kind of the, the agency that, that is requesting it. Um, obviously, Hennepin County does maintain the, the signal within uh, at the intersection there. So they have proposed to um, you know, contribute a, a significant portion of that. Um, but, uh, you know, other than that, it's it's kind of a negotiation between us and, and Hennepin County. Thank you. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, uh, Darren, uh, it, for a moment here, let's just kind of go back here for a second and uh, you know, pretend that uh, we didn't have this agreement coming um, uh, to kind of get this done. How would something like this project be done? Would we go through a PMP uh, process to, to, to get it resolved? Help me understand how that would work uh, with, without this particular agreement. Uh, Councilmember Lohman, Mr. Mayor, are, are you speaking of the, the agreement with Hennepin County or the, the federal safety improvement grant? Uh, either. Let's say we didn't get either of those things. For this particular intersection, let's say we don't have any anything else, how would we go about uh, 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 making this change to this particular area and improving this uh, uh, intersection? How, how how would that how would that work? Uh, Councilmember Lohman, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So I guess that it, you know if if a, a segment was on a you know Bloomington State Aid route. Um, you know, that safety improvement could be identified and, and those funds could be paid in, entirely from our, um, our state aid account. If it was, um, you know, within a, a different portion of the city, not on a MnDOT state aid route, 
um, that funding would would need to, I guess, come from someplace else, whether it was a uh, our traffic engineering fund or um, you know another identified source. And and in, in terms of, of of this particular area here, so we wouldn't be looking to use a PMP uh, type uh, solution to try to solve this particular area, right? You know, just just so I can understand that, just for my understanding. Councilmember Loman, Mr. Mayor, that that would be correct. So. The, the, I guess the, the PMP serves as um, kind of our, uh, doesn't necessarily serve as uh, including safety improvements at intersections within the city. And since this area is, you know, uh, uh, utilized by the broader public uh, in terms of the transportation that comes through here, that's why it's appropriate for, the, the, for these particular safety uh uh, measures to, to be considered along with the, uh, the, the crash data that, that's there and you've, you've mentioned that. Um, and so in terms of um, how this work gets done, other than those, those uh, 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 residents that are there who um, may be a part of the, uh, the uh, easement uh, acquisition, what other costs will be associated uh, with those folks that are in that intersection? Uh, Council Member Lomer, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, um, the the cost for are you talking about the cost for the what the city's going to incur as far as um, right of way acquisition? Uh, not the right of way acquisition. Does any is there any other cost that uh, if you if you're living in that particular intersection that you would be um, um, uh, on the hook for um, other than that acquisition uh, piece? Because uh, so obviously, if there's a land taking, that's a cost. And obviously, I would, would say that uh, with the traffic and the two lanes there, that's a cost too. But beyond those two things that are, that are obvious, is there anything else that the, uh, the property owner would have to uh, uh, endure or have to pay uh, for this particular project? Uh, council Member Lohman, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. No, we, we've identified, um, you know, our project sources and, and we do not propose, at this time, we're not proposing doing any type of special assessments for those abutting uh, property owners. And then finally, uh, Darren, uh, if, um, you know, I mean, obviously, folks are going to be impacted uh, by this. Um, and, uh, you know, if I was living there, you know, I mean, certainly uh, you know, having part of my, my property uh, removed, what is it if we were to do absolutely nothing uh, in, that, in that area, uh, uh, what, what would happen in terms of that? Would we lose those dollars? Um, help me understand what would happen if we just weren't to do anything with this project at all. Yep, Council Member Loman, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council. Yeah, that's that's correct. I and um, this is my my first federal aid project memo, but I know Bob Simons, our senior civil engineer, is is also on there. But I believe that those dollars do have a sunset date. So if you uh, don't use them in your program year, they do get uh, I guess returned back to the uh, federal aid office. So essentially, what I'm hearing you say is, we don't use those dollars. Those dollars go away, and we'd have to find some other, you know, tax way to kind of pay for that. So essentially, uh, uh, from a from those taxpayers who are not in this particular area would have to cover that, or unless we found some other grant monies to uh, to to do this. So thank you, Mayor. Just want to get that clear as we're looking at this. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I noticed in the. Uh, comment uh, cards that were provided by residents. Uh, there was a lot of concern about heavy truck traffic cutting through on 106th over to 35. Is there, uh, I guess off, off the top of our heads, any indication that the improvements at this intersection would encourage additional cut through traffic? Uh, and maybe it's a separate conversation, but um, are there improvements uh, or elements that could be worked into this to try and discourage some of that cut through in the future? Councilmember Martin, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Yeah, that that was a uh, a talking point at our neighborhood public meeting. Um, there was quite a few comments on vehicle traffic and, and truck traffic and speeding on 106th. Um, again, this this project is um, you know localized to to that intersection. Um, we are not uh, currently proposing doing any you know traffic volume reduction um, you know items as as part of the project. So. Um, unfortunately, no, we're, we're not proposing to include anything at this time. I will say, though, Councilmember Martin, and, and I saw those concerns also and realized that this project probably wouldn't address those in this way. 
but of course then it went right to my thoughts went right to the um, uh, the discussion we had a couple weeks back about how to improve safety and speeds and just overall traffic in the neighborhoods and throughout our community and uh, given the number of folks who did comment on that I think that would definitely be a part of a conversation as to um, how and where to restrict truck traffic or heavy truck traffic as it tries to get from through Bloomington to uh, especially to the freeway so absolutely Council, any additional questions? Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two quick questions. Um, how does this uh, impact or relate to a project that we looked at just informationally at 106th and Xerxes? I think there was maybe a potential roundabout at that location or some other things. Um, second question, how does it impact any future alternative transportation plans in that area for um, bike, walking, pedestrian type facilities? Councilmember Nelson, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So uh, there, there are some different alternatives for the um, for that 100 and 106 at Xerxes. Um, that that intersection is going to be uh, investigated with uh, with the fire station uh, project in the future. Um, and then as, as far as your second question, as far as the alternative transportation plan um, included in the, I guess, the project layout is we we are proposing the inclusion of uh, some type of um, on-road bike facility going on the uh, northbound Xerxes and connecting into the uh, on-road bike facility that we have just north of there, kind of by the uh, railroad tracks. Um, we currently don't have anything off-road, I guess, planned for, for Old Shakopee Road, but again, that is a, a Hennepin County uh, roadway. Council, anything further? Seeing no more questions. I, so I want to uh, explain, we, uh, officially on our agenda, we don't have this listed as a public hearing, but I know that there's a lot of, inform uh, a lot of interest in, in commenting on this and folks who would like to talk. And I do want to explain also, typically we would have uh, posted this 10 days in advance in the newspaper record in the Sun Current. We didn't do that because there, because there are no assessments attached to this project, we weren't required to do that. We did, I think it was middle of last week or so, we posted that this was a public hearing on the website. And so more than happy to, to hear people come forward if they have questions, comments, uh, suggestions on, on this entire project. So um, it's, um, it's a kind of a loosely organized, loosely formatted uh, public comment period or public hearing, but we're definitely gonna have one because I know folks are here who would like to talk about this. So we will open this up now as a public hearing on this item. And if anyone would like to come forward and speak, we'd be more than happy to have you. So please come forward. I'd like to ask your... But, but I'm going to need you to tell us your name. Oh, okay. And, My and name sign is John, in. John Marshall. And then just because we do this with our public hearings, we're, we try and limit them to five minutes. So if uh, ha should, happy to hear you speak, but uh, we're, we're going to just try and make sure that we, everybody gets a chance for the equal amount of time. I, I wanted to ask you... Uh, as you're, as you're going east on Old Shakopee towards Xerxes, is anything being done to help the traffic route from Old Shakopee to 106 for those people that use that to get access to the freeway there? That's used quite heavily, especially in rush hour. And right now, there's not a turn lane for the right hand, but there is a, an island out there for that. But once you get three cars backed up there, you back everybody up and the traffic backs up. So I was wondering if any of that was in the, in the thought process in putting this all together. Mr. Rezac? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, the, the, I guess the, the pork chop that we like to call it, um, <laughs> will, will still, will still be in there. Um, we, we currently out there, we are not proposing for the, the inclusion of a, a right turn lane to southbound Xerxes Avenue. Um, and I know the, some of the concerns that were, that were raised up at the, at the neighborhood meeting was the, uh, southbound Xerxes to that left-hand 106, that there is, uh, quite a few people that, that do make that, that right turn and then the quick left turn right there. Um, and then that, that does get backed up, but, uh, at this time, no, we are not, uh, proposing the, I guess the inclusion of a right turn lane there. Okay. I, that was only my question. I guess I was hoping for those people that use that and go through our city that I was hoping that would 
be thought of and make it easier for them to transition through the city as they do that, but whatever. Uh, for myself, when I'm in there, I always jump down to 108th Street and come across because I live on uh, west of that a little bit. Thank you for your time, gentlemen and ladies. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, just a, a quick clarification. We, we did actually advertise this in the Sun Current as a public hearing. Um, we did do that on the 5th and then the 29th. Thank you for the clarification. Yep. Uh, Councilmember Nelson, do you have a, a comment or question here on this particular uh, question from Mr. Marshall? Um, yeah, I drive that intersection every day to get to my office and I frankly have the same question as the commenter. <laughs> Um, it often gets backed up if there's two cars queued there and if there's more queuing space. And I guess my my question specifically is, was that analyzed if we're going through the process of uh, redoing some of these widening things, uh, property acquisition? Um, what were Was that analyzed and what were the pros and cons if that analysis was done? Mr. Rizak? Uh, Council Member Nelson, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, I would, uh, I guess, I would have to report back. The uh, unfortunately, the the grant was put together and submitted before I was employed with the City of Bloomington, um, so I do not have that information off the top of my head. But I know we have Bob Simons and Julie Long um, also on. If if they had any background information for Council Member Nelson's question. And let's be fair and give credit to the person who asked the question, the, the resident there. I forgot. I apologize that I don't remember his name, but no, don't give me credit for something that wasn't my idea. So, Mr. See, uh, Mayor, Ms. Long, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson. Um, we did look briefly at that right turn lane. The issue is we've also heard a lot of complaints about the traffic on 106th. So if we build a right turn lane to make it easier to access 106, we reinforce that problem. So we tried to walk a fine line and we may not have made the right choice, but that was the choice we made when we submitted the application was to not include that right turn lane. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this? Any questions or comments on this project? Please come forward. If you could sign in and tell us your name as you get started, please. Hi, I'm Colleen Higgins. My husband, Tom, and I live on the corner of York in Old Shakopee. Okay. And uh, at 10517 York. And we're one of the properties that are being uh, impacted by this. Our whole side yard, they're moving Old Shakopee closer to our house. And we've lived there since 1962, when Old Shakopee was a two-lane road. <laughs> and this is a residential neighborhood. And so our, uh, our property, we've tried to keep kept up, and, but we have a six-foot cedar fence all the way around there. We have a sprinkler system in our yard, and that's all, and we have four big mature trees on that side. And they say they're not gonna touch the trees, but how about the roots? Uh, we've, um, they've told us, they've sent us a paper with you know, measurements, but they have never came and showed us for how far into our property they are going to go. The first time they came, they said that we asked them about, there's a telephone pole in the boulevard right between our property and the property behind us. And they said they weren't, we're going to try not to move that. Well, now they say they're going to. So it's going to be brought into our property. 
And uh, and then because with this, you know, they have to widen the sidewalk, they have to widen the boulevard, and that's just going to be a mess. We had the property, they had the assessor come out, but we have no results from that. So it's going to lower our property value without any. So really, we're a pro opposed to this project, I guess you can tell. But because Xerxes is not that busy of a street. Xerxes North is only goes up to 98th Street. It's not. And like they're talking, the ones going south are going down to 106th Street. And uh, in Xerxes North, there is only a two-lane road. And they're, that corner there, they're saying they're having right turn lanes, left turn lanes. And they're even having a right turn lane off of Xerxes to go east, uh, west on Old Chacobee, which doesn't make any sense at all. We live one block away from there. We have no problem making a left turn onto our street, even in rush hour, because <laughs> all the traffic is on the outside lane because they're going down to 106th Street. So it, um, it just doesn't, most of the accidents, like we said, they're accidents. The main ones are speeders and to pull out of our street uh we have to watch till the light turns red on xerxes and then we have to wait for the cars that go through the red light before we can pull out onto our street i mean onto old shakopee from our street so it just i can't see the big what what's what it's going to make any better it really, it, it, and it's just affecting all the neighbors in not good ways. So I just wanted to say, I'm, we're, we, we're opposed to it, so, but I just wanted to let people know that we are opposed to it and it is going to lose, lower our, our uh, property value because our yard is going to be smaller mm -hmm. and the noise now in the trucks and it's coming closer to our house is not what we're looking for thank you understood so i i, I appreciate your your concern and your opposition and so on so but the things that, that we can control and, and it could at least answer some of the questions that you've asked um if if we could make sure that uh mr higgins or mr rezak and or somebody from public works gets out there early this week in the next couple of days to show you exactly the measurements and where things would be and yeah it would be nice to I'm know sure that would be what's helpful going on. And, and a phone call perhaps from the assessor's office with some specific information for you i think would be uh would, we, if that would be helpful I, we, we can make that happen as well okay okay thank you all right thank you so mr rezak can you uh make sure that you get out and, and visit the the higgins family in the next day or two here yep that sounds good, Mr. Mayor. And if we could uh, make sure that our uh, assessing staff gets the message also that we might want to make sure that they, they get a phone call as well so they have, understand the impact on their property value as well. Uh, Mr. Mayor, clarification on that. We did hire an, an outside independent appraiser uh, to complete the appraisals, but I will I will touch base with him and uh, make sure that information gets over to them. Appreciate that, Mr. Rezac. Very good. Anyone else like to speak? Please come forward. I'm Pat Palava. I live at um, 3030 West Olshockpee. We're uh, right on the corner, uh, northeast corner of Xerxes and Olshockpee. Um, I hadn't planned to talk, but everything she says is true. Um, our property values are, I mean, we moved there in 67, so we've been there over 50 years, and when we were moving in, they were taking our land to make ex, make four lanes. Then they put in the lights and they took some more of our land. And now they're going to put a turn lane in and take some more. We're not going to have any front yard. I mean, this is ridiculous. 
And like she said, I don't understand how this is going to make any real difference in that corner because it seems that most of those accidents are people who are running the red light and they're going to run the red light anyway. What's the difference? If they want to put a, a turn lane in, why don't they do it like they did over on Penn? Now, they said that <clears throat> Xerxes and Oshakby has so much more traffic, but 98th Street in Penn has a lot of traffic, and they have a, they have a turn signal with just two lanes so that people who want to turn and go down old shot or go down to 106 can turn. Um, I don't see why that wouldn't make a, if, if you think that that's really going to make a difference to just put a signal in with the two lanes. And if that works at on Penn and, Osh and 98th, I don't know why it couldn't work where we are and save us all uh, big mess on our yards and our property. And I would also like to see uh, the assessor see what he has to say. Uh, I can't believe it's not going to make a huge difference in our property. Thank you. And thank you. And um, I, I think the, I don't know what the answer is there. I think maybe Mr. Rizak could offer some, some input. I, I, I'd go through that 98th and Penn intersection 10 times a day. So I, I know full well what you're talking about in terms of the, but it's the, it's specifically the left turn, the left turns uh, north, let's see, headed west, west to north, and then east to south, but uh, not north or for not f south to East. I mean, so there, there's, there's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a combination of things, and and you're right. It's a, it's one way of doing it. I, I will say it does. It it works, but it doesn't. I don't know if it would work to the traffic volumes and speeds that we have on Old Shakopee. And I, I I don't know that for certain. I mean, I I turned to Mr. Rezac for the. The speeds are the more. same as on 98th Street. They're 35 miles an hour. It. Uh, I think the speed limits are the same. I think the speed that is built up from uh, stop to stop. You know. Uh, Moving, in, moving either stop sign to stop sign or stop light to stop light. I, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd rely on Mr. Rezac for some expertise on this. Mr. Rezac? Mr. Rezac said that the, there's too much traffic that it would make. Well, why don't we, let's let That's him. That's what he told me. Let, let, let's, is, is that the answer, Mr. Rezac? Is the traffic, are the traffic volumes heavier? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that, that is correct. The, I just quickly pulled it up on uh, on Google Maps. and the, It's a similar situation on, on West 98th Street at Penn and that we have uh, two through lanes in either track in either direction with a uh, protected left turn movement, um, but the the volumes on 98th don't don't match those as at West Old Chakby Road, and it would be, um, I guess it's more or less a, a similar situation that we have right now out there at Old Chucks and Xerxes. But Xerxes is not a through street. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't. It goes from 98th to basically 106, because after that there's Nothing. I mean, there's just houses. It doesn't go anywhere. So it's, it's, anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson, uh, your hand up again. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Just a couple of clarifications. In terms of the um, costs, um, obviously, we've had a couple of people talk about the diminishment of their property values, and that is essentially what the acquisition cost is, is to reimburse them for that. But um, we had someone raise a sprinkler system, just other examples might be fences or other personal type items in there. Um, the loss of trees, how are those items compensated if if that has to be done, if they have to be removed? So Council Member Nelson, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. So uh, in regards to irrigation systems, so those get, um, if those do get damaged during construction, we do include a you know a construction bid item to repair those. So those get uh, repaired under the project. In response to uh, uh, Mrs. Higgins, the six foot cedar fence, if if well if that if the project gets ordered and it gets impacted, this uh, the city project would be um, installing that fence at a location in the you know outside of the of the new proposed easement. Um, 
as well as uh, trees also get taken into account for the uh, appraised value as well. And uh, if a tree does get impacted or uh, or removed as part of the project, we do offer um, replacement trees on a on a one to one basis, and that is the the city's policy on all of our PMP projects. So um, some of the you know if it's a if it's a mature tree, it might not be the same. Um, I guess diameter caliper size, but we do offer uh, replacements um, to those property owners. Thank you for that information. And then just one other quick question in terms of the accident history, obviously um, fairly significant if it raised up uh, to the county's level of concern. Um, do we have any more details on those in terms of what actions led to the accidents, if it was running of red lights, if it was, um, you know, waiting to turn for traffic or, you know, what, it, was there any pattern in that, that, and, uh, that helps inform the design of this intersection? So, uh, Council Member Nelson, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. So the, the, uh, statistic I spoke on with, uh, the 23 reported crashes and the 50% of those crashes were right angle or left turn into crashes. So those, um, the right angle or left turn into crashes would, would indicate that that was as part of a, a turning movement. Um, as far as the, you know, the specific eastbound to northbound or eastbound to southbound uh, traffic data, I don't have that information with me, but I, I believe that that was provided in the grants. And I know I see Julie just popped on there. Julie, do you have any more background on that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Nelson, I don't. Darren, you, you did a nice job in answering it. Primarily, the majority of the crashes are left turn crashes or right angle crashes, which uh, left turn bay can solve pretty easily. We didn't see a lot of statistics on red light running. That's not to say that it's not occurring, but it is not occurring with a high crash frequency. And uh, with that crash data, uh, the thing that always concerns me taking a left, uh, you know, trying to go north on Xerxes from, you know, coming west on Old Shakopee Road is being rear-ended. Do we have uh, do we have any rear-end crash data as well? Mr. Mayor, we do. Um, people get distracted with um, looking at devices or they're not paying attention. And so, yes, we do also have some rear-end crashes. And again, by moving those left turning vehicles out of the through movements, it should help reduce the number of crashes. Um, earlier, you had asked about other um, accidents on Old Shakopee Road or other areas where we may have similar problems. Um, just to provide you some more background, the intersection of Old Shakopee Road and Old Cedar Avenue also um, has a crash issue that's higher than average. A lot of the intersections along the corridor already have left turn crashes, so or left turn bays, so we aren't seeing the crash problem there. But on there is one other intersection on the corridor where we are seeing a similar issue. And that doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you. Uh, so just as uh, those those questions were asked, it made me it occurred to me. Uh, that if, uh, and you, I, know, I realize you don't have the crash data in front of you, but if you were to, as uh, some of the residents have already stated, were to close down, uh, you know, one side of Xerxes, would that, would that make this project not necessary? Help me understand uh, uh, how that would impact uh, what we're trying to do here with that. And then secondarily, um, as we, uh, let's try to see if we can figure out my, uh, I'll just ask this question to get it out of the way right now. So when, when, Council Member Loman, when you say close down, when, what do you mean by that? So if we were to, so uh, if you weren't able to, to turn on to Xerxes going northbound, let's say for example, you were to just close that off. Um, or alternatively, um, because the, the, the question has been stated out here that, um, Getting onto 106th Street, that's where we're really seeing the uh, the traffic coming from. Is folks coming down? And I know for reasons um, from sa public safety standpoint, we wouldn't want to do that. Um, obviously, because the fire station's right there. But if you were to close that down, how would that impact this mm -hmm. uh, piece? So I, I wanted to just ask that question. 
Um, but we, we also recognize that having that access from a, you know, if, if Yuli Seal was here, he'd probably say having that access going from uh, that fire station up Xerxes Avenue from a public safety standpoint would be the reason why you wouldn't want to close that down. But I think it's worth, you know, since we're going to have impact here if we do this project, I think it's worth asking the question. Um, because it's not only just for uh, traffic reasons that we have uh, have that open. Um, so I, I guess that's the question I have here. And I, I've got another one um, that I know was asked uh, inside of the packet around uh, what's the most environmentally safe uh, approach to take uh, with this uh, intersection. And so I wanted to get comment on that too. Mr. Rezac or Ms. Long, was it another consideration of, of closing one of our streets that abut uh, old Shakopee Road, something like uh, Xerxes? Um, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, there wasn't consideration of that. And Hennepin County is always a proponent of closing access um, to their facilities if if they think it, it's um, reasonable. I would agree with Councilmember Lohman that I think the proximity of fire station two and the response time probably influences that. And anytime you close an access in um, a traffic situation, it doesn't mean that those cars disappear. It means that they reallocate themselves to other facilities. And we're not sure exactly where what routes they would take. So we may be trading one problem for a different problem. And Thanks. Council Member Loman, your other question? My other question, before you get to the other question, uh, help me also understand this 98th Street and Penn piece too. Uh, because I, I still, in my mind, you know, uh, other uh, folks out here have asked, why why can't we do on 98th Street and Penn and do that here in this intersection? Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. Help me understand that. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, Council Member Lohman, I'll take a stab at it since Mr. Rezac took an earlier stab. Um, one of the issues that we will have is that it has an increased cycle length for their traffic signal. So the amount of time that people have to sit and wait to make their movement would increase because we're not allowing the lefts on both Old Shock P Road to go at the same time. Um, I'm sure council has gotten complaints when we have our side street stops um, from other residents where the delays, it appears really long. And so we are, we're concerned with the increased volumes on Old Shakopee Road that the cycle length would get really long and people on the side streets nervous. So if you can combine those movements at the same time, it reduces the delay by half. And so that is what was the factor into why we want to add a left turn lane. So it's for basically it's for speed and the queuing there uh, that you'd have on especially Xerxes southbound that queue would would literally go all the way past 106th Street in some occasions if you did what we did on 98th and Penn that's what I'm hearing you say for example. Um, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, I think we're talking about the same thing because you said speed and speed in an engineering um, world means like 35 miles an hour. That's not the speed we're talking about. We're talking about the time that you're sitting at a signal or the time of delay that you're waiting for the light to turn green, yellow, red and get service a second time. So I think we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. No, I, I just, I expanded it on you there. Sorry about that. So you answered my question and I, I took it a, a different place. So yeah, uh, uh, sustainability uh, with vehicle, uh, uh, is this more sustainable than what we currently have? Um, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, um, we do believe it is because people are not sitting in the through lane waiting for s service. Um, so there's less car pollution. Is it significant? It is not. It, but it is a small step in the right direction. But it is not significant. Would there be an alternative that would be more sustainable that would have less impact on the neighborhood? Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Lohman, we are not aware of one as Mr. Rezac went over Earlier, the roundabout is a good alternative in a lot of locations. Unfortunately, that is not um, a location at this particular spot where it would be a good alternative. 
Um, so in, uh, Darren used the example up in Richfield where the volumes on all four legs are pretty much the same. So people don't have to stop and wait for a gap to um, access the roundabout. So in the, those cases, a roundabout is much more sustainable. In this particular case, because of the unbalanced volumes, we don't have an option at this time that we believe is more sustainable. Councilmember Loman, I just want to interrupt you here. I think we're getting into council discussion at a time when we're trying to do. A yeah, Mayor, and I want to apologize for that. I yep. realized we were getting into that uh, as we, as I asked that uh, as your question. I apologize for that. Not a problem. Sorry about Not that. Not a problem. Mayor. Just want to make sure we have a chance to hear everybody's concerns or questions that they would have, uh, the folks who are here this evening. So is there anyone else who would like to speak on this? Anyone? You're going to come forward or no? Okay. Ms. Cheney, is there anyone on uh, the phone who would like to speak on this? Nora, do we have any callers? Uh, there are no callers on the uh via phone line, you may proceed. Okay, Nora, that is the last of our public comment, so you can disconnect. Thank you very much, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this? I would. Uh, please. Should I sign in again? If you would, please. Okay. I'll see if I can talk and sign at the same time for all of us. I live in that area off of 106th, and I'm just reminded of the long discussion about having an additional um, on-ramp and an alternative route uh, for folks getting onto 35W going through the theoretical uh, Overland, or Overlook Drive area. I'm sure we all remember that. And I just want to... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to speak on behalf of the folks who spoke tonight, property owners who are going to be impacted by this, because it just seems to me that this trickled down from being a complaint from one group of property owners to now a complaint from another group of property owners. And so I don't really see how, um, how the property owners impacted by this really deserve that. Um, I, it seems to me that the issue that is causing these problems, these accidents, are um, we've, we've, we've heard tonight mentions of speed. We've heard tonight mentions of people not paying attention when they're turning left. We've heard a lot of reasons for these accidents that have nothing to do with these property owners who literally are having this dumped in their front yard. So, um, so just as, as, a, as their neighbor, I don't live in that intersection. I live over on 106th and Queen but I drive it every day and it's not my favorite intersection by any means, but I do absolutely believe if you have to do this, um, I, I recognize that there, there's compensation involved for the property owners impacted, but if, you, if you've done everything you can do for them and there is not an alternative, please try to do a little more for my neighbors. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Coat. If there's no one else, or if there is, please come forward. Please, yep, please. Otherwise, we'll, otherwise we're going to move on, and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak who would like to speak. Hi, I probably shouldn't be talking here. I don't he live here anymore, in that, but I used to live on Xerxes North Shakopee, the corner that took, you took my yard from. My uh, wife's folks had that house built there, so that house has been in the family up in, for 50 some years until we moved, after they passed away, we lived there. And we moved there. Uh, a lot of changes have been done there. One of them was 110th Street when they, when they put in, 106th Street when they put in. That was supposed to be. No trucks allowed on that. It was not made for trucks. The bridges weren't supposed to be not made for trucks on that. But all of a sudden, we got big dump trucks going through there. Now every kind of truck, imagine what goes through there. Uh, first thing is they took the corner away from my folks' place and that, and uh, it just just don't seem right. I Like I say, I probably shouldn't be the one talking because I don't live there anymore, but uh, just the thought of it 
If I did, I'd really be mad, I think. Well, thank you for your comments. And, and I'm sorry, if you could, I don't know if we got your name officially for the record. If you could tell us your name. Larry Berquist. Thank you, Mr. Berquist. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Anyone else? If not, Council, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing tonight. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member uh, Lohman and a second by Council Member Martin to close the public hearing on this item. Hearing no further Council discussion, <coughs> Mr. Brillhart. Beloga. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0 to close the public hearing. So, Council, we've uh, we've kind of interspersed some uh, commentary and some questions and some uh, thoughts on this uh, as we've worked our way through the questions and the public hearing here. Uh, any additional thoughts or comments, how, how we would like to move forward on this or how we would like to look at this? Council Member Coulter? Thank you, Mayor. Just a, a quick one um, for Julie. Uh, you, you mentioned, and I, I just want to clarify this because I was the one who asked about you know comparisons to other intersections. Did you bring up Old Cedar and Old Shakopee just sort of by virtue as a as a comparison and to say that it is also an intersection that has um, similar crash issues, or is that, I mean, is that within a roughly similar order of magnitude magnitude to this this particular intersection? Does that question make any sense at all? Um, Mr. Mayor, council member, um, I will try my best to answer what I think I heard you ask. And if not, <laughs> sure. we can correct that. Um, I brought it up the intersection of old Shakopee road and old Cedar, because it also has a significant accident issue. It is not identical, but it does have a lot of similar characteristics where it has a lot of unbalanced volumes. In, this, in the particular case of that intersection, it is the westbound to northbound movement, which is significant, as opposed to anyone trying to go south. Um, so it is not 100% identical, but it does have a crash problem. It does not have dedicated um, turn lanes. And so that was why I brought it up. So hopefully that makes sense. Did I answer your question? You got very close, and I suspect you didn't get all the way there because I asked it in an extremely poor way. Uh, my The second part to my question is such that you're able to answer tonight in terms of the number of crashes. Are, are Is that a similar or you know number or maybe even percentage in terms of traffic volume is that a is that a similar intersection to old uh old Chalkby and Xerxes or I mean how does that compare numerically I asked it so poorly she disappeared <laughs> I think we've lost yeah, wow lost. Lost her. <laughs> so Mr. Rezac I think we'll uh if you're not able to answer that question if you don't have those numbers at your fingertips tonight I guess I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, but if if perhaps we could uh, follow up with that and maybe provide some of that information. Uh, yeah, I, I think that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Council, additional questions, comments? If not? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Rezek, were there any uh, looks at what banning rush hour turns uh, from Old Shakopee to, you know, the left turn movements, uh, both AM and PM, was that uh, looked as an alternative? Uh, Councilman Beloga, Mr. Mayor, uh, that uh, restricting the, uh, I guess, turning movements in, in any direction on either Xerxes and Old Shock uh, was not investigated as part of the, as part of the grant application. But I, I do uh, understand what you're talking about, and you see the the signs in in various communities uh, restricting that those turning movements at certain time periods in the morning and then the afternoon. How long would it take us to do an analysis of uh, restricted time turn options and add that to the uh, idea of you know? Uh, 
doing something like that in lieu of uh, the proposed project? Uh, Councilmember Logan, Mr. Mayor, I would have to uh, speak with our, I guess, our traffic engineering about uh, implementing some type of, of study to um, kind of take into effect of what you had described there. Uh, so probably taking a wild guess, three to six months. Uh, Councilmember Bologa, yeah, it would be, uh, you know, a, a significant time frame to, to put that together to, you know, gather the data and then, um, you know, interpret it in a, in a way that, you know, we could use for a future project. And what, what's the uh, uh, approximate distance between Xerxes and Penn on Old Shakopee? Uh, Is that it's, I suspect it's about three quarters of a mile to a mile somewhere in that neighborhood. Councilor Arnbologa, if you give me a, give me a, a quick second here, I will uh, Google Maps that. Uh, Councilor Arnbologa, Mr. Mayor, we're at about uh, 3,500 feet from, uh, from Xerxes Avenue to Penn Avenue. About three quarters of a mile. So, um, what, is there a standard for uh, having cross traffic routes on a major thoroughfare as far as spacing of distances. Councilman Blog, are you are you talking about the distance between two major intersections as in Xerxes and Penn on Old Chocopee? Uh well uh, no what I'm I'm trying to get to is there a standard for the spacing of um, on a major thoroughfare? between cross street uh, intersections for uh, traffic because uh, you've got to the north, you've got uh, uh, France, then you've got uh, Xerxes, then you've got Penn, right? So um, if we did eliminate, what would the impacts approximately be knowing that there isn't a study? Uh Councilman Blog, I don't know if we if if we did some type of restriction on uh, on Xerxes Avenue for those turning movements, um, without doing a you know a kind of an in depth traffic study as to where that other traffic goes. I don't know if we could put together a, um, I guess a number that we'd be comfortable with presenting. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Well, Council, uh, I think we've talked through this and, and looked at different possibilities. Uh, I think different um, alternatives were presented. I don't know if uh, how they would inf affect the the financing, the financial aspect of this, the the federal grant that we have available and the, the Hennepin County money. Um, I know it's probably not a perfect solution, but in terms of the safety, I think I would uh, see this as something that would certainly include improve the safety in that area. Uh, as someone who has made that turn from east to north, that's, it can be nerve wracking to have folks coming up behind you or trying to cut across uh, those, those two lanes of traffic. So um, I, would, I would look for motion. I, I just wanna say, I, I think I, I would be in favor of this. I understand that there would be impact on properties. I understand that there would be uh, the compensation to offset that, understanding that they would replace the, the, the fencing and uh, underground sprinklers. The trees, absolutely, it's not gonna be a one-to-one -one replacement because you can't replace a 60-year-old tree. I, I get that, I understand that. But uh, I think from uh, just from a safety perspective and a traffic flow perspective, this seems to make some good sense. And so I'll be supporting it. Um, others, if, if you have thoughts on it or if we wanna take action on this in one way or the other. Councilmember Member Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I, I, as, I, as I look at this, this, this uh, intersection, um, uh, number of things kind of come to mind. And first I want to uh, kind of address those folks who uh, are, you know, ha are having their, their property impacted. Um, you know, there's nothing quite like that. And I know, Mayor, you, you talked about it. Uh, um, it and, and so I just think it, it behooves us uh, to, to do as much as we can possibly do to try to make sure that if there's any way possible to try to uh, reduce that impact uh, for those property owners that we, we do that. 
you know, staff has come forward and they said that they've they've looked at a number of different things. The only thing I've heard here tonight uh, that uh, that restriction around turn lanes does sound interesting to me um, uh, to to try to look at that. If there is a way for us to look at that, um, because if, if there's a way to, I mean, I, I mean, I hear the stories of the history here. Uh, folks kind of came here and. Um, and they talk about when you know when this was a you know two lane going one way, then they, then they got taken again, and then the turn lane got taken again, and um, and so I'm just wondering if we're you know we're doing a slow bite, and eventually we get to a point where we <laughs> we just take it all, and so I just wonder uh, if it makes some sense. You know, certainly I'm supportive of trying to do this. Uh, uh, you know, and I, I know it's not realistic to think we're going to close down any any roads because of the public safety standpoint of this. Uh, but if there is this last uh, ditch uh, opportunity to kind of have a look at a restricted turn, um, that would have less of an impact. And I know we were talking about, you know, around our priorities of slowing down traffic, if this is a realistic way to kind of do that. Um, because we look at the accident uh, profile of this, um, and some of these things, you know, I, I have the question too that, that, that uh, residents have as well around uh, that that impact, you know, is it because of distracted driving? Is it because you know traffic is moving too quickly? So um, I would feel better um, in supporting this if we would consider uh, what um, Councilmember Beloga has put forward uh, uh, to see if there's any possibility that, that might work. I recognize it may not, and then we're right back where we're at today. But I just think it behooves us to look, uh, you know, to, to have this one last look for these residents who. Uh, who've lived here and been ta taxpayers for a long time. And so that's what I would ask uh, if, if council would be open to that. But I, I do think, Mayor, you've stated, well, it's here. We've got the, the safety data's here. They've looked at another thing. So I'm just asking for one last look here. Other thoughts? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Well, um, I, you know, to, to pick on, pick up on, excuse me, a couple of things that council member Loman mentioned. Um, you know, I, I think restricting left turns is an intriguing idea. I think it, it is um, absolutely something worth exploring. And, um, you know, knowing that the plans and specs would still have to come back to us, I'm hopeful that that, um, that, that can be done, that there can be, that we will have time to, to evaluate that fully. And, you know, I've, I've heard from a number of neighbors about this. I think I was even at a couple of your doors a few weeks ago. Um, and you know it you know i i think barring something like that that left turn restriction you know mayor like you said this is this is an imperfect solution and i would i would go so far as to say to to the folks who are here tonight and and neighbors watching at home yeah it's incredibly unfair that that this happens to your property that you bought you know many years ago and and i'm sure all good upstanding citizens and and pay your taxes and cross at the green and all of that. And it's, it is unfair that, that this is, is what has to happen. But I, I think, you know, I live probably closer than anyone else on this council to that intersection. I live on Upton, just about a block north of Old Chalkby. So I, I drive that intersection literally every day, anytime I want to go anywhere, basically. Um, and I, you know, I've seen some close calls and I've been in some close calls with, with those left turns. So I, I get it. Um, and that that is a real safety issue. So sure. I think if we can if we can look at the 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 turn restrictions, I you know I think that does make a lot of sense. I'd I'd be curious how that would work with the traffic volumes on Old Chalkby. I'm I'm a little unsure of how that would that would affect any backups and that kind of thing. Um, it it is not a perfect solution. Um, in this world, perfect solutions very rarely exist. And and in my now almost four years on the council, I've found that one place in which that is particularly true is traffic and, and street design and, and all of that. There are just almost never perfect solutions that satisfy everyone. Um, so barring that left turn restriction, I, I think this is the, the best solution we have, uh, but certainly I get it from the, the folks who live nearby. It's, it's hardly a good one. And, and to Mr. Coates' point, you know, I, I hope we can go even above and beyond and, and do what we can to, to not only compensate folks, but, but just provide the, the information and access and all of the things that folks need to feel like they, they can and should have in the community. 
Uh, Mr. Rizak, I think you mentioned it earlier, it was, at least it was discussed earlier. Is, is there a sunset on this funding, this federal funding and uh, Hennepin County funding? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm uh, uh, currently jabbering with uh, Julie Long, our city engineer, and she does believe that uh, we could push this project to 2023. Um, I do just want to reiterate that that Old Chalkby Road is uh, under Hennepin County jurisdiction. So um, restricting those turning movements or um, you know, anything along those lines, we would have to get buy-in from them and they would be ultimately the ones that would, uh, you know, be, be responsible for that intersection or for the traffic signal, I should say. Understood. Council, additional thoughts? Council Member Martin? Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Yeah, just, just uh, real quickly, I, I, if it's, I'm only hesitant on a study because if it's going to take three to six months, how much more staff time cost is that going to add on top of this project? Um, so that, that's kind of on my mind. But it, it does sound like we, we've got the data that shows this is going to have a pretty substantial impact on crashes and reducing crashes at major intersections feels like one of the chief responsibilities uh, of a city. Uh, so, so yeah, some, some serious impacts here that should be compensated that should absolutely be offset. Um, but to the point you raised earlier, Mayor, pairing this with a robust conversation about how we reduce the other f uh, just under 50% of crashes that aren't attributed to these turn lanes uh, is something that I'd like to move pretty aggressively on down the line. So I, I'm in favor of, of moving forward on this. Um, I would just hate to spend all this time to come around and reach the same conclusion in six months. So. So, Council, where do we stand on this then? Uh, does somebody want to make a motion? Councilmember Lohman? Well, I'll give it a shot. Uh, and what I'll do is um, I'll go ahead and add my amendment in there, and we'll see what happens. And if that doesn't happen, then we'll, we'll see what, what happens with that. So um, I'll go ahead and move to uh, adopt a resolution to enclose the vis uh, feasibility report and adopt a resolution to order improvements for Xerxes Avenue and Old Shakopee Road intersection improvement project uh, with consideration of a turn restriction. Second. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mean the time turn restriction? Yeah, time turn. Yeah, thank you for the clarity there. And do we need more clarity than that in terms of timed turn restriction? Mayor, members, but what I understand uh, the the motion to be is that there would be staff consideration of a timed um, time restricted turn. Is that accurate? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a motion by Councilmember Loman. I think Councilmember Coulter with a second. Discussion on this, Council. Councilmember Beloga. Uh, I'm not quite sure how this would operate. Could somebody help me understand? I, I, I'm not quite sure myself, Councilmember Beloga. Um, I, I think the, the the general idea here, I think the direction is that to to um, move approval of what we have in front of us, based on or contingent on a, a study of timed turns, a, a timed left-hand turn at that intersection, and uh, the feasibility of it, the um, I don't know the cost ramifications whether yeah. or not we can get approval from Hennepin County, all those different pieces right. of I the mean, puzzle that have to come into yeah, that. Yeah, if any one of those things, let's say, for example, Hennepin County is absolutely wouldn't do it without the ends of that, then we'd have to move on. So that would be the way I would look at it. Uh, let staff kind of, I mean, figure out what the spirit of it would be. If there's a problem with it, then we'd just it, it'd be, it'd be over and we'd move to this. Um, but it, it just, it's just that one last look to see if there's uh, something. And I'm not sure that I'm interested in pushing this out to 2023. That that's not. I mean, I mean that I don't think that's reasonable either. So um, I, I don't think I could support something that would push this out that far. Uh, Ms. Long, I see your hand up. Then we'll get to your question and your comment, Councilmember Nelson. Uh, Julie, can you chime in on this? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, um, Councilmember Beloga, I'm not going to turn on my video just in case that was the issue. But as far as the timed restriction, we have an example on Normandale Boulevard. If you're headed southbound and you want to turn eastbound into Toledo Road. So I think that would be a good example of what you're looking at. So during certain times of the day, we don't allow people to make that movement. So that would be what we would look at. 
Uh, Mr. Keel. Uh, Mayor Council, maybe if I could make a suggestion, I would suggest that the motion direct staff to investigate uh, the ramifications of such a movement and to report back as before we do the plans and specifications and that yeah, the council would then make a decision whether to proceed with plan and specs or order further study. I think that's a, a sound suggestion. Uh, Councilmember Lohman? Absolutely for that, as long as my secondary would be okay with that. So oh, don't, go, don't go far, Carl. We're probably going to have to repeat that so we can write this down. <laughs> Mr. Mayor and Council Members, what I heard Mr. Keel say is that the motion, and I understood the motioners to uh, understand it this way too, is that, uh, that uh, plans and specifications would not be ordered until staff reported back on the uh, potential timed turn restriction. Uh, and so I, I guess the only question is how long staff thinks it'll take to do that and when we could expect to see that come back. Mayor, and, and, and the only other thing I would say is, uh, or barring that Hennepin County would not allow us to do it because that would kill it immediately. I, I, yeah, I think that would be part of that initial okay. investigation. I, think. I don't want that to hold us up, you know, if that just as they say. I'm assuming that would be part of the initial investigation. Let me get to Councilmember Nelson first and then Councilmember Carter. Councilmember Nelson? Thank you, Mayor, um, and appreciate the effort of my colleagues to figure out um, some alternatives here to address the concerns of residents in that area. I think it's good. Um, one of the things, and I don't want to make the motion longer, but one of the things that I think would be important to consider is um, unforeseen impacts. As an example, if you can't take a left-hand turn off of Xerxes, would you just go up Vincent? At a, and take a left-hand turn at an uncontrolled intersection and cause more problems um, or things of that nature. That, and I, I have confidence that staff would look at that type of stuff, but I think a comment was made earlier that, you know, if we do something like this, it doesn't get rid of that traffic. It maybe moves it somewhere else and creates a different problem. Um, the secondary thing that I think we need to make sure we keep front and center, and again, I don't know if it's to this motion, so, but, uh, Mayor, I think you were absolutely spot on that this highlights the conversation we were talking about earlier in terms of traffic within our community and highlights uh, the issues of one cut through traffic. The reality is a lot of this traffic going through that intersection is not Bloomington residents, it's not Bloomington businesses, it's not people going to patronize our Bloomington businesses, it's people trying to get to Edina and they wanna get off of 35, they don't wanna deal with 494 and they're cutting through our city to do this off of 106th um, and, and, and things of that nature. And I know we had a very unfortunate situation a year or two ago when there was a fatality just north of this location with what I believe was some cut through traffic, not a delivery in a neighborhood. And so, I mean, those are extremely significant issues. I don't think it says we don't do this project because I think there's merit given the accident history and the reality of how that intersection is used. But um, I think this issue really highlights those issues throughout the community. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Mayor. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. He actually asked one of my questions, so I'm good. Thank you. Very good. So, uh, Ms. Mandershay, could you read the, uh, the motion back to us as we have it in its current state, please? Uh, thank you. I appreciate the challenge. Um, <laughs> uh, motion by Lohman seconded by uh, Coulter to adopt resolution number 2021 to approve the enclosed feasibility report and adopt a resolution to order improvements for Xerxes Avenue and Old Shakopee Road CSAH one intersection improvement project with staff consideration of a time turn restricted with a time restricted turn um, with a condition that they report back to council um, before council consideration of possible approval of plans and specifications. I think that sounds right. The only thing that I might suggest then is a, 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 a by, by do by date and um, I don't know, Mr. Rezac, Ms. Long, Carl, I mean, what, what would be a reasonable time for the staff to bring a report back like that so the council can either say yes or no, I, we want to continue this down this road or no, let's do what we got in front of us tonight. Uh, Mayor, I think uh, Darren or Julie can answer the timing for when we would anticipate having the plans and specs back. And we would prepare a, a report to you about the 
staff's perception of the benefits and disadvantages of a turn lane restriction there, or turn left turn restriction there, it would probably not include a full blown traffic uh, study. That would be not, not, not enough time to do that. Uh, but and it would be up to you to decide whether you felt that our uh, staff analysis was adequate or not. Mr. Rezac, Ms. Long, uh, when would the staff analysis, what, what would be a reasonable time for that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would, uh, I guess, could provide an answer. Maybe Julie can right now. Um, but I do have uh, tentatively our next uh, council action would be to approve the plans and specs and set the bidding schedule. And we currently have that in the schedule right now for uh, February of 2022 is when the plans and specs uh, would be back before council. So six months out, you think, for a staff analysis of this? The questions being asked here tonight? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think that'd be a, a, a good estimate, yes. Very good. Very good. All right. Council, do we understand what's in front of us here, the, the motion that has been made? Is there any further discussion? So we have a motion and a second. And the, uh, the motion, as our city attorney just read it not too long ago, and with the understanding that it would be uh, early next year, the first quarter of next year, before we would get the staff report back. All right. Hearing no further council discussion on this matter. Ms. Brillhart. Beloga. Aye. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. So we will hear back on this item uh, probably in, oh, in, do we want to do the just compensation assuming that even with the, okay, we want to do that? All right. Uh, then I will look for a motion. Council Member Lohman. I'll, I'll go ahead and move to uh, authorize and direct staff to set just compensation and make an offer of, for easement acquisition for Xerxes Avenue and Old Shakopee Road uh, intersection and improvement project. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Martin to authorize staff to set just compensation. Hearing no further council discussion on this. Uh, Mr. Oh, Mayor. Uh, I'm sorry, Council Member Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so how, how does this operate? Does, does this give uh, staff approval to go and acquire the land or to just begin to make offers subject to the final approval in item uh, that we just voted on? The, the, the verbiage that I'm reading here is to set just compensation and make offers. I don't think it says you know, make the, uh, finalize the transaction. I don't think that would be reasonable to finalize the transaction if we were still up in the air in terms of the, uh, uh, what direction we're going here. But Mr. Mr. Rezac? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Member Beloga, that is correct. So the, uh, the, the table that was included in the agenda packet for those seven parcels. So that dollar amount in there is from the uh, report that the appraiser had completed. Um, so what we're requesting is uh, council, I guess, acknowledge the dollar amounts that are in there. And then that's the, the basis for our negotiations with those seven parcel owners. So um, if the motion carries, then, then we will use the, um, use the figures that are, that are in there. And that's where we begin our nego negotiations with property owners. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate the information. Additional questions? Yeah. I, 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 I'm sorry. We're, we're, this is uh, specifically oh. to, to the council. I don't know that so we I'm, can. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I apologize. I, I think we can, we can answer questions outside this, but we're, as we have a, a motion on the table, uh, I think we have to move forward with what we have. We can try and get to the questions later. So we, we will do that. We do have a motion and a second uh, for just compensation. Any further questions? Mr. Mayor. Council Member Beloga. Uh, is this also a public hearing? The, the public, no, this, the, the public hearing was on seven, this is a, a resolute or a, a motion within 7.3. We've had the public hearing on item 7.3. Very good, thank you. 
All right. Mr. Brillhart. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Now, if you have a specific question, I would recommend uh, the gentleman right to your left, uh, Carl Keel, is our public works director. Perhaps uh, if, you, if you took your conversation out front, he could probably answer just about any question you would have on this project, so he'd be happy to do so. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's move to item eight, our organizational business this evening, and item 8.1, which is a discussion on our facility needs and our capital improvement project funding. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Our chief financial officer, Lori economy Scholler, is gonna walk us through this item. Uh, what we're really uh, looking for as a, a result of this discussion is just general understanding from the council about where we're at on our, our CIP and our, our future funding, how we go about, um, you know, achieving our goal here of, of meeting our facility needs uh, and uh, specifically maybe responding to uh, some uh, recommendations here on how we may accomplish that over the next couple of years. Lori? Ms. Economy Shoulder. Mayor and Council, just to start the conversation, um, a lot of our data that we're utilizing is from the 21 through 2030 CIP and then we've inflated the numbers in some instances. So in this piece, um, I did give hard copies to the council members in chambers, but I just wanted to go through, um, I know you have um, a park master plan coming forward in a few weeks. What we plotted out here in the charter bond area and specifically in um, the CIP is I only pulled out bonding related projects um, if they're projects for our utilities that are um, not where we're utilizing fee-based um, revenues or that type of thing for the capital improvements, they are not part of tonight's discussion. So it is only where we would have charter bonds, capital improvement bonds, or probably um, permanent improvement bonds, and then should the council move forward at some future date with um, local option sales tax. So the first piece is that we look at park and rec um, projects and looking at here, we um, put them in and as you see that number is a lot smaller tonight uh, that you voted on earlier and just over $2 million. But we have projects here moving at $4 million every other year and we had them group them in that kind of dollar amount so it made more bonding sense so that if the investors um, like a larger dollar amount to make bids on. And then we just inflated the numbers as we go through the years um, for the park and rec projects. And then we looked at the CIP bonds. CIP bonds are normally your fire, public safety, public works bonds. Um, and so currently looking at fire station fours build out at 11 million. Hopefully that's a high estimate. And then again, we've inflated those and we put them every other year. And that was what the spacing was in the CIP, along with the spacing for our public works number. Uh, Carl said that this number of 26 million for animal shelter and the public works garage, not certain if they're gonna be together or in different locations, but those numbers still look good. Um, in the permanent improvement area, um, we have a consistent pattern and that is the pattern that they have um, put together for me and inflated it and that's been in the CIP for a number of, since the early 90s. So just in those areas of those three bonding types, we are looking over this 10 year period at $186 million. You know, the total for the fire stations and public works was 81 million park and rec at 17.5 and PMP at 87. So that 187, when I look at our 1% market value amount that we can utilize, just putting in these projects here, utilize um, pretty much the cap that we can utilize for um, these, if I just looked at these bonds, they, let's see, these two ones that count as the 1% we're 
we're getting close um, to uh, 100 million. Right now, when we look at the city's market value, we're at a 15 million, 15 billion. So we would, um, our cap would be at 150 million outstanding at any one time. So hopefully we don't ever get there, but if we start bringing up some of the projects that are below the line, we could get closer to that number. Mr. Jamie? Mayor, if I can interject, Lori, is it okay if I interrupt? Uh, yep. I just wanna be, be clear about what the 1% number is that you're referencing. Uh, and, and this is the requirement for uh, the city as it pertains to charter bonds. Uh, we call them charter bonds because the Charter Commission had, uh, approved this change in the charter several years ago to allow the council uh, to issue debt. And uh, state statute allows us to go up to 3% of the city's um, uh, tax base uh, market value. And uh, the Charter Commission wanted a more um, conservative number uh, for the council issued debt. And so they set that at 1%. So when, when the CFO is referring to that 1% number, that's the limitation that was set by the Charter Commission several years ago. Back in 2016. So it's a, a recent thing. And before that, um, we had no ability really to issue debt for any park and rec project. Um, so when we looked at just pulling out some of the projects that were in the CIP that might have regional significance, we looked at... Um, the Dewan Clubhouse bunker and fencing, um, that's at 13.3 in the CIP. Um, the big amount that the council looked at um, several of the Bloomington Ice Garden project pieces earlier this spring, and we put a state bonding request in for $28 million. We won't know until May, June of next year whether any of that is approved or not. Similar to um, Public health and that um, 17 million that's for the public health building is within that 65 million dollars for the Creekside replacement. And that does not include any land. If we need to um, move the location to some other location um, on transit, that 65 million does not include any land acquisition. And then um, currently for the BCA expansion, um, that is at 33 million dollars. Um, Highland Greens is on there, just as I was including one golf, I put both golfs on there. So um, we have, um, when you look at the total here, $145 million of projects. When we looked at local option sales tax that the city manager walked the council through two meetings ago, um, the cap that we could issue was approximately $150 million. So, and we can only have five projects. So just... Putting five projects out there, they can be swapped, they can be moved around, but just putting this together as an example. So are there any questions on this before I move to the more complicated debt schedules? Okay. So this, uh, you're using this as an example? Just as an illustration of just how I cut the debt to uh, build the tables. Understood, okay, thank you. not make it as busy. <laughs> and Mayor and Council, before uh, Ms. Economy Scholler gets deeper into the spreadsheet, because there's a lot of content in this spreadsheet, I want to encourage you to ask questions as we go. Uh, Lori walked through this with our executive leadership team, and uh, you know the, we deal with these numbers quite often, and we still had a lot of questions, so um, don't hesitate to ask as we go. So, um, let's see. I want to start with the next one. This is where the total levy is at 5%. So in this illustration, so it's just an illustration. Yeah. So the levy, 5% every year for the next 10 years, just to illustrate how we can bond and do these pieces. 
So if the operating levy stayed at 3.5% and then the capital and bonding amount each year, we designate at least 1.5% of the tax levy towards existing debt and then just future capital. So just looking at the math, 3.5 divided by the 5 gives you 70% of the, each levy increase would go towards operating levy, 1.5% for capital over the total 5 would give us 30%. And then in the modeling that I did, I preserved the P&P debt levy that we need each year going out for the next 10 years. And I, so in that stream every year for P&P, that was preserved. So we cover our P&P before we looked at facilities and parks. If the bond structure were for parks and it was a charter bond, um, that was a 10-year structure. And if we built a facility, it was a 20-year bond, 20 20 bond structure. And I know we had a great interest rate today, but in 10 years from now, I don't know what that interest rate will be. I don't know what the interest rate will be in March. Um, so I just did an average of looking at our past 10-year history and came with a 2.75. So in all the models, the interest rate remained exactly the same at 2.75. So then we start building the model. Let's move this up. So for 2021, our tax levy is 66 million five. I rounded it. And we broke that up with 61 million going to operations and 5.5 going to debt service. Again, just keeping the round numbers to start with. And if we have a zero levy for 2022, because the debt is going up and we're, um, we just issued to debt, debt today and we have our PMP debt, I'm gonna need um, 700,000, which is approximately a 1%. So when we move that 1%, um, we got to subtract out of operations to move it to debt. So you see the operations going down. And then I just started adding that 5% each year. The net change, which is the 5% net increase. So 66 million to 69 million, 3.3 million. And it breaks up. 70% of that 3.3 million came to operations, and 30% went to debt. And that's how this part broke down. Any questions on this section? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can you just repeat what you said uh, about the 1% where you pointed to the green box? So I'm going to just write right, right on there. Yeah. Can you? So that's a 700,000 increase. So if you look at the 66.5 and did a 1% of that, um, that's um, $665,000. And I'm just rounding again that that's about a 1, it's 1.06 that got us there. Got it. Thank you. So, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, that's basically the, the increment of tax levy increase, right? And so the, our base levy is at 66.5. One percent would be an increase of $665,000. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, this uh, modeling on the debt levy, um, does that assume that the items included right now in sales tax revenue bonds are possible? Local option sales tax are those included in there, or that would be no, nope, no. I'm just building this, and I'm starting to put um, just the CIP in charter bonds and PMP bonds in there. Perfect. Okay. Thank N you. None of the projects that are that were below the line for local option sales tax are not in there. We're included in these models. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You ready? Council Member Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, quick question. So. You modeled this with a uh, 2.75% interest rate. We just did one at 1% 1 now. Obviously, we don't know where it's going to be in the future. Um, unlikely that it will be significantly lower. We're at pretty darn low rates now. Um, and 
costs on projects tend to go up over time, oftentimes increasing at uh, above inflationary rates. So I guess the gist of my question is, is there an advantage and have you looked at modeling, moving some of these projects up to do them at lower cost and at a lower financing cost? And what does that long-term model look like if we did it that way? Mayor and council member, um, when we looked at this, um, we looked at with the incremental increases um, in inflation and pulling it back, what we were trying to do with the model is keep the debt, um, excuse me, the total tax levy in a reasonable or smaller amount. Um, the council at times has done a 5.75 for a number of years back in the, um, back a while, but um, you know, these are 5% increases and we didn't want to um, put huge numbers out there by, I mean, you still have to pay for this even, you know, I mean, when we think about the fire station, when we first were modeling a number for fire station four, it was at eight and a half million. And now as we're looking at steel costs and all the other pieces, it's closer to 11. So um, just moving it forward doesn't always help. Mr. Ruge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson. Uh, uh, Lori's correct, and uh, we did also talk about a couple of possibilities. One is that we would um, potentially uh, uh, do a larger bond now when money is cheaper. Uh, there, uh, there's a problem with that, though, is that with capital debt, when we issue it, we have to initiate the projects that are being paid for with that debt within a certain period of time. So we can't, we can't sort of bank that money until the project comes around. And that begs the second question, well, why don't you just do all the projects together? And that just comes down to a staffing capacity issue, right? We can only manage a certain number of projects unless there's a, a commitment to doing that, in which case we'd have to um, just ramp up our, our construction management uh, capability here uh, to accomplishment. And that only has its limitations, <laughs> well, it has its limitations because um, with, the, with the two primary um, projects that are being funded here, the fire station replacements um, we're having to take those fire stations out of service because they're teardowns and rebuilds on site. We're not putting them in new locations. Um, so the ability to do more than one of those at a time is infeasible, right? So we have to phase those. And then with the um, park and recreation projects, uh, this four million every other year is an approximation of the implementation plan for reinvestment uh, coming from the park system master plan, right? And so there's a concern about uh, we'd probably have a couple of $2 million projects or maybe one large $4 million projects. But I think there's a pretty high expectation on community engagement. And so we want to be able to give ourselves ample time to do community engagement in between those projects. So yes, it's possible we could do a larger issue and say we're going to do uh, a serious commitment to our park system master plan and do a whole bunch of projects at once. And again, it's just a staffing capacity and community engagement uh, uh, capacity to get those projects done. Okay, I'll move on to the next section. So in this column here, um, what we would have is all of our current debt that's outstanding as at the end of the year. So and how we need to pay that and issue um, the tax levy for that at 105%. Those are what is in our Biden documents that we are required to um, levy for and pay for. Um, as of today, I get to change and reduce these amounts. So that's a good thing. Um, and then this is based off of the PMP amounts that um, have been given to me by Public Works in our, in our CRP and what the debt service is needed on each and every one of those. Um, annual amounts. So this column here, K, is just the subtotal of these columns here to equal this one. Any questions on this section? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Let's remember Beloga. Uh, Laurie, just, just for clarification with that $4 million every other year for the um, uh, Parks Master Plan, 
that did not include the, the parks master plan does not include funding for the normal uh, reconstruction of the parks, you know, the park playground equipment and so on. If I recall the parks master plan, is that, am I recalling that correctly? My general, Mayor and Council Member Belogan, my general understanding from um, the Park and Rec Director is that $4 million would include everything. It would include um, the facilities in those locations. It would include the parks, playgrounds, um, signage. It would include everything that parks needs to enhance what they have and um, make it, a you know, renew them. Uh, thank you. I'm going to move on to the next section. So on this piece, I'm going to go this direction now. And I'm just going to go. We're going to, we're going to just keep it simple. Easy. Oh, that's an even better idea. We'll only go down a little bit here. So we're going to start with K, column K. And what column L is now, I look over here at column F, that 8 million, and we'll use 2024. projects here. Uh, now let's just start at the beginning, 2023. So in 2023, it's now, the debt service levy has now increased and it's received 30% of the 3.3 million. It's total amount that would be levied and set aside for debt levy and capital. And I'll round it 7.2 million. We need to subtract out our existing debt, which is 6.5 million. So I have at this time 652,000 available for other projects. So what I did here is here's the project at 11 million, 2% cost of issuance with 11.2 and just using um, the, the payment formula within the system, we've calculated what that would be at the, um, utilizing, let's see, fire station, you have 20 years, 2.75, and then um, utilizing that, we also have to increase that by 105% for the required state debt service amount that we have to levy for at 105%. So that would be $773,000 a year that we would pay for the fire station. And that's down there and it follows all the way down. So if we issued that total amount, we've now used more than what we have, but hopefully the project comes down a little and we can afford that. If not, We'll have to find another source to pay for that, 121. Moving down to the next year. So the 5% levy now gives us 3.5 million. The amount for debt is now 8.3. The total that's existing and outstanding existing 2021 charter bonds and 20 and the PMP because there's 6.9 we now have available 1.3 million so you see here we have a little bit more here that we could absorb the negative above and that 4 million park projects 2% cost of issuance utilizing the formula in the system gives us $495,000 for the payment for that levy. 
We now have a little extra that we can store for the ne a future debt of 71000 So in these two years where we have CIP bonds and part charter bonds, are there questions? Moving on through. I'm a finance person and I love spreadsheets. So you're going to have to follow on your screens or with the paper copies you have because we're going to start missing the lines. So we're in 2025. <laughs> so it goes the same way all the way through. And you know, when I look at 2025, the amount that's available for the garage is at 1,190. Um, but when I look at what I need for both a garage and animal control up here at 1.8 million and what I would need for parks, I don't have enough to fund both of those in that year. So I'd come down here and they're both there. So I'm really short by 493. Um, so when I use that, I can't, I can't issue debt in 2025. I have to wait to 2026 to the issue the debt for those two pieces. Right. And Mayor, if I could ask a question on that one, then. That's Member Loman. So then, if you don't, if you don't issue it that year, then you push that project, you know, out, or how does that work then? So I wouldn't issue it in the T year. I would issue it in this year, and so that money, the one million one ninety. Do you see where we have that available? Mm -hmm. It comes and it's available. To, to be here to offset. So when I do issue th that next year, that for, I'll call it, round it up to 500,000, mm -hmm. I'm using that 1.90 to, to pay for that $500,000 extra piece that I need. No, I'm following you, thank you, yeah. It, so I, I, I tried to maximize what I could in each year. Um, and in some years, so hopefully we won't have to issue that much, but in some where it, it's almost 500,000, I had to push that out. And it goes all the way through until we issue the last fire station, six in 2030. For the levy in 31. So we're down there, and at that point, um, we've got quite a bit built up. You know, when I looked at all of those together, um, you know, there's several years of negatives throughout, and they get absorbed. And, um, you know, by building it, we have flexibility 10 years from now to do more projects. But between now and then, um, it's a year-by-year -year basis of what the council, what the valuation changes are, and what the really what the council might want to do in those years. This was just illustrating if we did a 5% each year, and if we can keep operations at 3.5% and carve out the other 1.5 for debt. Mr. Brugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, and just building off Lori's last point there, you know, we had to, to, for modeling purposes, we had to pick a number, right? So I just want to repeat the mantra for the night. This is for illustration purposes, right? I don't want anybody to watch, watching this at home to think that this is a fait accompli. But what we did need to do is model out how we are going to move through our CIP in a way that still keeps these projects uh, on schedule 
Um, you know, the point that I want to make about the items that are on this list, uh, these are these are the larger um, facility needs, the ones that we're likely to need to issue debt for. Um, smaller projects, you know, if you go into our CIP, there's a whole bunch of other projects in there. Most of those get funded through the facility fund, which we budget for on a regular basis. Okay? Or there are a lot of projects in there that have other revenue sources, right? So these are just the ones that would be um, utilizing the general um, tax levy. So how do we stay on track? Uh, the one thing I want people to know when we're talking about these projects, especially the ones that are above the, the green subtotal line, the ones that are charter bonds, CIP bonds, um, are projects that I think, well, especially the CIP bonds, are essential service projects, right? These are our fire stations that are, um, I'll use the word antiquated, and to some extent market obsolete, simply because they were constructed at a time when the apparatus was much smaller, um, when we had, uh, frankly, a different staffing model. And so, you know, we have outgrown these fire stations. Replacing them is a matter of when, it's not if, okay? So we're trying to make sure that we have a methodology available to the council to provide assurance that these projects can get done in a reasonable time period. So the whole methodology here is based on the notion that the council um, uh, commits to an annual appropriation, as it were, for debt service for capital projects, right? And so the one and a half percent that Lori has modeled is what allows these projects to proceed in the years that they are scheduled in the illustration, right? And then the rest of the calculation obviously has to do with the, you know, the decisions that we make around our annual tax levy. And that's, you know, frankly, that's going to vary from year to year depending on whatever the economic circumstances are, the needs of the organization, et cetera, et cetera. The three and a half percent for operations we selected because in most years uh, we see an increase for um, uh, just keeping the operation at par is usually going to be somewhere in that neighborhood of 3%. Right? And that's a pretty typical number. Uh, so that 3.5% is not um, an excessive number. I think it's just reflective of uh, um, what we typically do on a year-to-year -year and then what other emerging needs there are within the community. So that's how we came to that three and a half and one and a half number. But the biggest point here is trying to find a number that the council can commit to that will keep these projects on time. And then what Lori did was model out the years when those projects could occur based on that model. So with that sort of um, big picture, uh, now's a good time to get into questions if you have questions. One more item. Yep. Just the oh, red did, line. Did I red. miss part of your uh, spreadsheet fund? No, I just want to highlight again to emphasize um, yep. my indemnification piece of this. These worksheets are for illustration purposes only on the possible range in tax levies that may be needed in the future to support just these essential core services. These worksheets contain many variables and assumptions, all of which will change in the future. So, <laughs> thank you. So you did the, the modeling for the expenditures and I'm assuming you also did a modeling for the income. So bottom line, what, what would this, have you modeled what this would cost, what this would add to our uh, median valued home in Bloomington? Mayor and Council, I, I have not gone to that step at this point. We, we've looked at um, you know, just some of these assumptions and just trying to get to more of a levy number that we can take and put into that and you know, um, assessing group that works with property taxes can take this number and and do their best guess. Yeah, but we understood. It, it, again, it would be the a valuation best guess. I get that. And, and as as market values change and so on, I, I get that. But uh, Mr. Brugge, you yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Is the ability to estimate impact market value impact is um, very difficult beyond 2023, just because that's the time frame for the um, the pay year based on the assessments. And so our, our assessor staff has a pretty good sense of where we're gonna be for 22, pay 23. But beyond that, uh, it's it's tough to say. And as the council is well aware, uh, the Minnesota property uh, taxation system is complex to say the least. And so 
you know, the dynamics of uh, commercial and industrial properties and residential properties and um, fiscal disparities just makes anything beyond a, a year and a half or two years out um, really difficult to estimate. Yeah. Council Member Lohman? I'm sorry. I'm oh, I had one set of, one, another set of worksheets. Thank that, goodness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if we just, I, I can just, just have you focus that. on um, same assumptions, um, only this part, I didn't keep it at 5%. I just created a, a levy of what we would need to afford that project in that year. So um, if you want to just look at the blue column there, that is the levy to afford those projects based off of the timing that is currently in the CIP. So the big piece is that it would go up to, would be a 7.41% in 2024 because we would do the garage and park improvement bonds in the same year based on the timing in the CIP. We would go up to that. What you see in the rest of this is a lot lower in your handouts, um, but that again is keeping operations at three and a half and all the rest of it goes to debt. So that's all the piece I wanted to point out. Thank you. Council Member Lohman. <laughs> um, so I guess what Mike, I like how this is modeled out. And so, so with that being said, I guess my question that I had, um, and I, I'm pretty sure the city manager knows where I'm gonna go with this. If I wanted to add something to this, um, let's say sidewalks. Um, I want to keep that even with, um, you know, what we're doing, you know, on the other side of the house. What does that look like? Um, Mayor and Council, in our franchise fee discussion um, late last month, we talked about the two sidewalk projects on um, Nicollet and Portland, and those totaled five and a half million dollars. Um, you know, if we look at um, well, and I don't want to interrupt you. So I mean, we, we, we would just need to add that in, in those years, and they would add to the levy. You know, they would have been in the years um, 26 through 27, so it would be in. So I don't want to interrupt you. There. I had a kind of a different thought in my mind, and that, that's a good one, but it's a little different than what uh, you're putting forward. Sort of what I want to do, or my idea is, or my thought is, is that we would, whatever we are putting in um, for the trails, that we would match that. Uh, in, in the CIP, that this would be our instrument to, to match how much we're putting in year for year with the, with the trails. And maybe some years it's a little bit higher, some years it's a little bit lower. How would something like that work where we're trying to, you know, equal what we're, you know, putting aside, you know, year after year uh, for, um, you know, for our, um, you know, our sidewalks and those trails. And so that, that's the piece I'm trying to figure out. How do I layer that on top? And obviously with the CIP, you, would, you, know, would, you might do a bunch now, a bunch later, but how, how could I track that so that, so that I, could, I, could, I could reasonably tell a taxpayer that, you know, on par, if you were to do this over 10 years, they're going to be equal. Mr. Brugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman. I think the best way to do that is, uh, Council Member Lohman, to uh, ask your colleagues if they would like us to model that as we're putting together our CIP and then incorporate that in. So, you know, we do have our projection for trails that uh, comes out of the, um, the, uh, the franchise fee uh, funded um, project area. If you wanted to match the trails with the sidewalk, uh, we could do two things. One, we could look at including it in that in that model, or we could add it into the CIP uh, general tax levy supported model here, and bring that back uh, to the council when we're presenting the CIP for discussion and consideration. Um, it would just be a matter of if the council wanted to do that, Lori would just plug it into this model here, and then see how the dynamics change. Um, but I think that's the best thing to do is if there's uh, some some commitment by the council uh, to want to see that, to give us that direction, we'll prepare it. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. I guess uh, just, just briefly, I, I would be interested in that, especially in terms of 
uh, maybe not even a, a dollar for dollar match to what we're spending on trails because the sidewalk versus trail density and that was a little different east versus west different mileage to cover things like that but if we were going to invest in a big way top of the head what would that dollar amount be in sidewalks um and this this might be a bigger conversation we can talk offline but i guess my question is obviously just the way the community developed we put a lot of infrastructure out there pretty quick and it looks like a lot of that is kind of coming due is there a way we can be intentional about trying to break that cycle a little bit with how we're making these investments so we're not setting up a council 50 years from now to have to figure out the same situation how do we replace all this at once again uh, that's a good question council member martin mr Bruggie? i saw Lori leaning into the microphone so i was going to let her have first crack at that answer um Mayor and Councilmember um, Martin, when we look at, um, I'll just use the fire station as an example, and, and um, it was scheduled to occur five years ago. And so, um, you know, if we had started putting, but you know, economics and, and tax levy, and um, so if, if we build these, say, every five years, um, but we're already behind the dime on um, several of these, and we've um, truly kicked the can on several of these projects. And, and when you've seen the, um, I don't have the grid with me right now, but when we do the CIP, you, you see where all these facilities are in the red zone. So um, it is hopefully by tracking it now that as they're getting there, we take care of it. Yeah. And Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Martin, one of the things that we've talked about at staff that we would do that, you know, I, uh, not a criticism of any of our predecessors, but it's just not the forethought to do that, is with each of these projects identify, you know, when is that likely replacement date, right? And then start to build, you know, we have a 10-year CIP right now. We have a project list that goes beyond the 10-year CIP, is making sure that our project list goes beyond 15 or 20 years, right? So we can see those dates coming. But the other thing about getting into the cycle of utilizing um, the, the facility um, uh, debt is that when those come off the debt services, you can make a decision of whether you're co going to continue to cycle those through. I mean, we're talking about 10 or 20 year debt issues, and we're talking about 50 to 70 year facilities, right? And so uh, trying to figure out how we match up so that we don't get into the situation 50 years from now where all of a sudden six buildings need to be replaced in a 10 year time frame, I think will be a lot easier to accomplish. Council, anything additional? Council Member Lohman. So uh, this one example that you have here, Laurie, we've got, uh, in 2024 with a tax levy of 7 you know 41 if you were to try to smooth that out at all is there a way to i mean what would be the did you look at it all in terms of what the impacts would be by by smoothing that that levy out by by changing it or shifting that around at all i mean is there a way to mayor and council when you look at the two projects other than um, either waiting an extra year for the garage or carving out the parks, you, you can't do both. I mean, um, and, and the garage is um, quite a large item. So, I mean, when you look at the garage, that million eight, um, and I'll just, you know, again, rounding $666,000 is 1%. This is approximately a 3% tax levy just for this item. And so I guess. Uh, so it's hard to smooth out one item. Right. So you, there's nothing we could do. I mean, because I guess the reason why I ask it is, you know, we have a lot of, um, well, we're using it a different term, a positive, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, performance on our budget. Is there a way from an operational standpoint to, do some things in, in the year prior and the year after to bring that overall level down. So that as you're, because I, I just can't imagine uh, trying to pull something like that off at, at that amount. Uh, 
I mean, I, 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 don't, I can't, I don't think we've ever had a, <laughs> you know, levy that high. And so I just kind of, that, that scares me when I see that, mm-hmm. um, you know, forget the other fives that are on there, but uh, it just kind of scares me, you know, anything that's, you know, five plus. Yeah. M- Mayor and Council Member Lohman, that's why when I, you looked at the previous one, it got, sp- it, it did not occur in 23. It was occurring in 25 because we had to build up the tax levy base enough to cover that piece of it. So th- the first model had more smoothing than the second model. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, um, Lori, would it be feasible, I think, asking, following along with Council Member Lohman's question, so u- utilizing positive budget variance as an example, where uh, in most years we allocate those funds to the Strategic Priorities Fund, we could similarly direct some of those dollars into this capital project fund that you're using um, just to build that up. So that would certainly be at the council's discretion every year when we make that allocation about where you want to direct it. Yep. Agree with the city manager. So these are a lot of numbers and a lot to chew on now that uh, we've had them for a, a week or so now, but now that it's been explained to us, it takes on an entirely different light and take a look at it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, get to you in just a second, Council Member Beloga. So I think our homework here is um, go over this again. If you need to go back and watch the video of the council meeting and, and Lori's presentation again and go through this again a couple times until it all makes sense yeah. because it's, um, it's a lot of information. It really is. But I think, as um, Councilmember Lohman said, I, I appreciate the way it's laid out. It does make sense. It's, um, you know, math can be your friend here, and, and it just it, it does kind of track from point A to point B. It's just a matter of kind of wrapping our heads around all of it. So, Councilmember, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm available too if they Good. have more council. Councilmember Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Lori, did uh, you take a crack at uh, putting the um, below the line items for sales tax revenue bonds into one model? And if you did, what did that look like? Um, I had put some information together, uh, I would say about four months ago, and it was just shocking numbers. So I just sorted them out this way, but I can definitely take these two models and add everything um, below the line in there so that you could see the full impact on when we could either afford it with a 5% or when we could afford it over the next 25 years. And uh, I I think it's uh, valuable because uh, if, if there is a local sales tax option, of course, the voters have to approve that, correct? Correct. And they they really need to understand what the impacts are. Okay. And I think that's a way to help display that information. And uh, also then what the priorities would be. Because uh, if you were doing this with uh, you know, the order of magnitude of the items below the line, uh, it's going to extend uh, those items well into the future. Thank you. Mr. Verrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Member Beloga and Council Members. Uh, that's an excellent point. And uh, just to remind Council some of the numbers that we shared a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the local option sales tax, um, just utilizing our, our uh, next couple of years uh, median value as a base for calculating impact. If we are to do this $150 million of projects through our general tax levy and not through local option, it would be about a $220 a year increase to property taxes, uh, as opposed to about a $70 household impact uh, via the local option sales tax. So um, Council Member Beloga's point is very well taken, but for illustration purposes, I think it's a good exercise for us to do to either demonstrate uh, how much the impact would be uh, if, the, if these projects were all to occur in a similar couple years, and then consequently what the impact would be if we had to space these out over a number of years to get it to a number that is palatable to the taxpayer. Thank you, Council Member Beloga. Thank you. Council, anything else on this? 
definitely something to think about. Definitely uh, work that we need to consider, continue considering as we move forward here, because this has got some big impacts, not only financially, but also from a, uh, um, obviously from the um, facility and amenity and quality of life kind of standpoint from our community, how we want to rebuild it and catch up on some of the past deferred maintenance and um, build our centers of community and make this a, a place that people want to move to for a variety of reasons. So, once member Coulter. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, Mayor. Just to, to clarify with staff, there there is not any other ask here beyond look at these numbers and think about them, correct? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Coulter. We're, and we're not uh, suggesting that we would begin the annual uh, levy for debt service in 2022. Um, that if, if Council wants us to model that, we can do that. It would be good to give us that feedback now because we're preparing information to bring to Council on August 23rd when we're going to uh, have that preliminary uh, levy discussion uh, with Council and we'll share with you the, the, where we're at in the um, requested needs for 2022. <coughs> Uh, so that discussion is coming in a couple weeks. Uh, I would say that um, staying the course as we've laid it out here is uh, probably a good thing to do based on what I know about 2022 right now, and you'll hear more about that in two weeks. All right. Everybody good? Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate it. Item 8.2 is our City Council policy and issue update. Mr. Babrugi. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't have anything else for the Council this evening. Just want to again say thank you to Lori for uh, uh, doing her best to effectively communicate really difficult information in an easily digestible format. So, Council, anything to add? Uh, noting that we are at the 10 o'clock hour and we still have uh, our closed session to get to. So, anything to add? Councilmember Lohman? I'll be real quick here. We had a question here, and I think it just it's timely to ask it now. I think one of the respondents asked it earlier in the uh, um, in the meeting about our pride event, and I, I just wanted to ask the city manager, uh, you know, to to your knowledge or understanding, and maybe you can't answer this tonight, and I think that's perfectly fine. But I just thought it would be worth asking the, the question because um, there was a request to uh, cancel uh, the the event on on the fourteenth. Um, uh, because uh, that we were using money's money for a uh, secular uh, group or a uh, religious group. Do you understand? Are, are we giving money to any religious group? Uh, you know, for uh, the Pride Festival. To your, I mean, you may not know, but uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Loman, I appreciate the question. Uh, as I understood what the commenter was saying, was some sort of a suggestion that the event. Uh, has some basis as a religious event and that religion being secular humanism. Mm. I have not heard any of the organizers, any of the um, planned attendees, or any anybody else, frankly, talk about that. So I'm not sure where that commenter is, is um, gaining that insight, uh, but it is absolutely not a conversation that anybody here has had. So there is no religious affiliation. Uh, there is no confusion about the establishment clause of the Constitution uh, that has anything to do with the event on August 14th. And then finally, uh, she mentioned something to the effect of uh, sales tax dollars being used uh, for, um, you know, in, in reference to the lemon tax or lemon test. Uh, any sales tax dollars being used for uh, that event? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, I am similarly unclear about that comment as well. I, uh, as was shared with the Council before, uh, there is some uh, city money that is being used to help plan the event. We allocate a certain amount each year for the Human Rights Commission to do their work. There's $4,500 uh, that uh, the Human Rights Commission has budgeted for this event. Uh, there's also at least $2,600 in uh, donated community support. Uh, that is being utilized as well. So it, it truly is a community and city partnership to uh, do this event. There are other questions I have, but obviously I can ask those next week. Um, and, and the event is on the 14th. It is, uh, it's this Saturday. And I'm looking forward to uh, attending it myself. Um, I'm glad that, that staff has, as uh, uh, every year I've complained that we've 
send our money to Minneapolis and not do it here. And now, uh, you know, <laughs> it'll be here. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, thank you, uh, Manager Mayor. Council, anything else? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Well, once again, Council Member Loman set me up nicely here. And, um, you know, I, I wrote out some thoughts that, I, that have been kind of circling in my head here. Um, and I, I, I do feel like I need to speak to this, partly because this is our last meeting before Pride occurs, partly because we don't have a meeting next Monday, and partly because I've been getting lots of emails about this. And, you know, the truth is that what we've been hearing is a variation on a theme that the LGBTQ plus community has heard before. We have no problem with you, but why do you have to be in my face about it or keep it in the bedroom? In other words, you can be who you are if I don't have to see it. And I, I think for me, it, it just feels like don't ask, don't tell by another name. And I recognize, you know, the, the audience is pretty cleared out how here now, and I don't know how many folks are watching the council meeting at 10 o'clock, but I need to say this. The whole point of pride is to reject that thinking in its entirety, to celebrate who we are as a community, all of us. And individual performers aside, we can have that conversation another time if we want to. We need to be clear that drag is a part of LGBTQ plus culture. It is a part of the culture of that particular community. And that is a community that has long been ridiculed, abused, discriminated against, and continues to be even today. I'm gonna try to keep myself from getting too emotional here. This is a community that represents our friends and family, our neighbors, folks we go to church with, our teachers, doctors, nurses, paramedics, firefighters, and yes, even police officers, the very same folks that some of these people here tonight were claiming they were backing just a few weeks ago. But we also need to understand, to be frank, that drag is a part of straight culture too. If you've ever watched an episode of the TV show MASH or watched the movies Some Like It Hot, Mulan, Mrs. Doubtfire, you've seen this before you. And one of the reasons I know that this is part of a straight, of straight culture as well is that just within the last few years, in that very auditorium, I attended a production of Victor Victoria centered precisely around drag performers. And if you're ever interested in seeing that production for yourself, it was a movie first starring Julie Andrews. Thank you, Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember Beloga. Got a hand up, it's an old one, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilmember, is anything else for item 8.2? All right, seeing none, we will move on to item 8.3, which is our closed session of the City Council. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Minnesota law allows for closure of council meetings for a variety of uh, different items, uh, not a lot of them, but just a couple, one of them being discussion of litigation, which we can move into closed session for. And so that's what we are going to do is move into closed session. Uh, we're gonna adopt a resolution here, moving into closed session, uh, we will, uh, Clear the council chambers, we will go into closed session and we will come back into open session to adjourn the meeting. So if you're watching right now, uh, you can stick around if you'd like, but all you're gonna see is us come back into session simply to close the meeting and, and adjourn. Mayor, and that might not be totally true. We might take action after the closed session on an item in addition to adjournment. Very good. Sorry for the clarification, but. Thank you for the clarification. We indeed might take, ac take action after the closed session, okay. So uh, that is where we are. And uh, so council, I would look for a motion to adopt the resolution uh, to go into closed section. So moved. Second. We've got a motion by council member Beloga, second by council member Martin to adopt the resolution directing the closure of a public meeting of the city council. Hearing no further commentary, but there are questions by the city council. Mr. Brohart. Beloga. Aye. Carter. Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries. We are officially in closed session, and uh, we will 
as I said, come back and do open session to either make a decision or not and to head into or to ultimately adjourn. So uh, council members, you have a separate uh, login that was emailed out to you. If you could go to that right now, that'd be great. Thank you.
closed session. We are back in open session now. Council, I would look for action. Mayor, I will make the motion just as soon as I can get to it. Councilmember Coulter. I have it, yes. And I'm, I'm going to... Mayor, I will move to authorize the mayor and city manager to enter into an agreement arising from the INRI Municipal Stormwater Pond Consolidated Litigation. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Coulter, a second by Councilmember Lohman to authorize the mayor and manager to enter into an agreement arising from the INRI Municipal Stormwater Pond Consolidation Litigation. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillhart. Beloga. Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. With that, we have concluded our agenda. Council, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Lohman to adjourn. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillhart. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Good meeting again tonight. Thank you to the staff. Thanks for being here so late, and uh, thanks to everybody who stayed with us and tuned in. Hey, folks. Have a good rest of your week. Congratulations, Matt, for flying solo on your flight.